On behalf of ICS, I would like to welcome you to the formal opening of the academic year, to thank you warmly for accepting our invitation to be our very special keynote speaker this year, and also for accepting the challenge to help us to think about a crucial issue for the world today, how to combine the response to the pandemic, to COVID-19 and to climate change. So thank you so much for being with us and uh, it will be an honor and a pleasure to listen to you in a while. I will go back to Portuguese if you don't mind. E, portanto, obrigado a todos pela vossa presença. Uh, num dia e num momento que é muito especial para o ICS, é o dia em que acolhemos e damos as boas-vindas aos estudantes, aos novos estudantes, como é também o dia em que juntamos a comunidade ICS para pensar e debater um assunto relevante do ponto de vista do futuro das sociedades contemporâneas. O dia é também especial este ano por ser um encontro por videoconferência, num formato diferente do habitual, por não estarmos juntos no auditório, por serem tempos difíceis. E, por um lado, estamos até bastante tristes. Por outro lado, estamos com força e ainda mais motivados, talvez porque sabemos, porque intuímos que o mundo conta connosco, com a ciência em geral, e com os cientistas sociais em particular. Também porque a pandemia nos mostra que existem múltiplos desafios que os cientistas sociais têm de ajudar a compreender e interpretar, e com urgência. São, por exemplo, os comportamentos humanos e coletivos, perante o impacto social de diferentes tipos de ameaça, que têm de ser analisados e explicados, à luz do passado, à luz de diferentes contextos sociais e políticos. São as tensões ideológicas relacionadas com as desigualdades e as identidades sociais, afro-americanas, indígenas, de género, que estão a agravar-se, a intensificar-se com a pandemia. São as novas barreiras e fronteiras, materiais e simbólicas, que a pandemia está a reforçar. Neste momento, de facto, as sociedades enfrentam múltiplos obstáculos e barreiras, face ao conhecimento e às ideias, face à mobilidade e às migrações, face aos sistemas políticos e aos valores da democracia e face também à solidariedade global entre países e entre comunidades. Por isso, e era a principal mensagem que queria deixar uh, hoje aos estudantes do ICS, para saber lidar com os desafios e as ameaças que as sociedades enfrentam no futuro próximo, as ciências sociais são fundamentais. Convidamos também, por esta razão, o professor Tim O'Riordan para nos falar desse futuro que nos preocupa a todos, o futuro da sustentabilidade, do ponto de vista de duas dimensões principais, da resposta à pandemia e da resposta às alterações climáticas. É um tema que nos vai obrigar a pensar no impacto da pandemia e das alterações climáticas no futuro da Europa e do mundo, mas não só. Também no que está a acontecer ao nosso sentido de humanidade, do que é ser um humano. Our sense of humanness, como diz o tema. E como é que o definimos ou redefinimos neste contexto de transformação turbulenta? Visto que é a abertura do ano académico, que queria dirigir mais duas breves notas aos estudantes sobre o doutoramento e o ICS. Em primeiro lugar, uma palavra de força e de entusiasmo para as vossas teses de doutoramento, para a ciência que estão a produzir e que vão produzir. Fazer um doutoramento é um desafio exigente, que implica adquirir e pôr em prática competências teóricas, tratar e interpretar dados, fazer um trabalho de campo longo, treinar a escrita, treinar a capacidade de comunicação. Mas fazer um doutoramento é também muito mais do que isso, pelo menos aqui no ICS, é saber combinar autonomia individual e trabalho em equipa, é aprender a praticar a dúvida sistemática que está na base do processo científico. A ciência é a produção de conhecimento organizado e comprovado, mas sempre questionável, aberto à crítica, uma crítica salutar e estimulante. Fazer um doutoramento também é aprender a articular as disciplinas, os métodos, as temáticas científicas, é saber estabelecer articulações. 
o que torna o doutoramento e o processo de investigação mais desafiador. Por último, acho que fazer um doutoramento é saber estabelecer a ligação com outros atores, com outros coletivos, que vão receber e apropriar-se do conhecimento produzido, no sentido de traduzir e projetar esses saberes, projetá-los para a sociedade, para as políticas públicas, para a capacidade de produzir respostas a problemas sociais emergentes. A segunda e última nota, para vos falar muito brevemente do ICS. O ICS, enquanto Centro de Investigação, é o primeiro coletivo que vos vai enquadrar, que vos vai orientar do ponto de vista da prática científica, do que é fazer investigação, do pensamento crítico, do que é estabelecer articulações entre disciplinas e métodos, dos desafios da divulgação da ciência e do diálogo da, com a sociedade. No ano letivo 2020-2021, temos pela frente um desafio adicional, como já foi dito, o de responder ao impacto da pandemia no ensino, na investigação e no dia-a-dia -dia de todos nós. É uma conjuntura que nos obriga a experimentar novas formas de ensino e de interação, a reinventar métodos e técnicas de inquirição e de observação. Claro que os impactos da pandemia nos, nos projetos de investigação são diferentes, depende da disciplina, da metodologia, da fase uh, do desenvolvimento do projeto, mas todos sentimos dúvidas e problemas e é fundamental falar dessas dúvidas e refletir sobre as possíveis estratégias para conseguir ultrapassá-las. E é curioso porque em maio, no Open Day do ICS, foi isso que os estudantes de doutoramento procuraram fazer, pensar em conjunto sobre os impactos da pandemia nas formas habituais de inquirição, de trabalho de campo, de aprendizagem. Aliás, está neste momento em curso a publicação de vários artigos dos estudantes sobre os problemas que foram abordados e discutidos nesse dia. O enquadramento situa-se por isso não só ao nível dos colegas e dos professores do vosso doutoramento, mas também ao nível da comunidade ICS, ao nível dos grupos de investigação, dos outros estudantes de doutoramento, das infraestruturas do ICS, os observatórios, os arquivos, a biblioteca, as edições, os seminários e as conferências, por exemplo, os seminários que tratam dos problemas éticos da investigação. Bem, e para terminar, dois agradecimentos e duas mensagens. Um agradecimento a todos os investigadores e técnicos do ICS que recebem, acolhem e formam os nossos estudantes. Um agradecimento especial aos serviços de estudos pós-graduados, à Maria Goretti, à Cláudia Andrade, à Raquel Brito, pelo trabalho competente e incansável que realizam. Um agradecimento especial também a todos os investigadores formadores, os que coordenam e organizam as ofertas letivas, dentro e fora do ICS, e todos, todos os que orientam teses de mestrado e de doutoramento. Um agradecimento especial à Comissão de Extensão Universitária do ICS e ao seu coordenador, que está aqui connosco, o professor Rui Costa Lopes, pela organização do Prémio X, o Prémio Extensão em Ciências Sociais, que vai ser atribuído hoje pela primeira vez no ICS, e cujos premiados uh, vão ser anunciados daqui a pouco. Uh, uma mensagem também do uh, Sr. Uh, Reitor da Universidade de Lisboa, o professor António uh, Cruz Serra, pediu-me hoje de manhã para vos dizer que uh, tem muita pena de não estar aqui hoje, porque está de viagem para o Porto, e pediu-me para transmitir os seus votos de um excelente ano académico e de muita saúde. E... Para terminar, uma mensagem final de apoio para os estudantes. Espero que encontrem no ICS um ambiente de trabalho acolhedor e estimulante que vos permita aprender, investigar, partilhar saberes. Contem com o ICS para vos dar apoio em caso de dúvidas, na elaboração dos projetos, nas estratégias metodológicas e também nos problemas relacionados com a saúde e a segurança em contexto de pandemia. Esperamos todos juntos contribuir para que o percurso de doutoramento que iniciam este ano seja bem sucedido. Muito obrigada. Vou agora passar a palavra à uh, Tânia Veiga, doutoranda do Programa de História, do PIODIST. Tânia, tem a palavra. Obrigada. A excelentíssima senhora diretora do Instituto de Ciências Sociais, 
professora doutora Karen Wall, a todos os membros uh, dos órgãos do governo do ICS, a todas as investigadoras e todos os investigadores, ao incansável corpo técnico, caros colegas estudantes. Hoje, toda a comunidade acadêmica do Instituto de Ciências Sociais está reunida de maneira inédita para a abertura oficial de mais um ano letivo. Estamos apreensivos, é verdade, diante do fato do governo português precisar decretar novas medidas de contenção da epidemia. Sabedores e apoiantes dessas medidas de isolamento físico e social, abraçamos a ideia de uma cerimônia de início de um novo ano letivo de forma virtual. Antes, contudo, de referir-me ao novo ano que inicia, convido-os para algumas reflexões. Se, a bem da verdade, epidemias acompanham a espécie humana em sua trajetória pelo planeta, a última de magnitude planetária ocorreu há mais de 100 anos e pode-se concluir que somente a geração que vivenciou a de 1918 passou por experiência tão conturbada e semelhante a esta que vivenciamos no presente. Nossos antepassados, como nós, praticaram também isolamento social, viveram dias apreensivos consigo e com os próximos e também acompanharam as notícias e as estatísticas. Mas as, as semelhanças esgotam-se aí. Para nós, esses últimos meses transco transcorreram repletos de dicotomias, principalmente aquelas geradas pelo avanço tecnológico e pelas exigências da contemporaneidade. Estivemos reclusos, é certo, Todavia, nunca tantas pessoas visitaram-nos em nossas moradas e, no, e viram nossas estantes, reais ou virtuais. Estivemos tantas horas sozinhas e sozinhos, mas nunca com tantas companhias nas reuniões e nas aulas pela internet. Com a paralisação das investigações de campo, nunca refletimos tanto sobre nossos projetos e refizemos nossos cronogramas de trabalho. Nunca talvez tenhamos ido tanto às janelas e às sacadas e percebido que a realidade é maior que nossa casa e que vivenciá-la depende também de uma relação de convivência e de solidariedade. Foi uma inquietante e uma instigante reclusão, portanto. Começamos agora o ano letivo de 2020 e 2021 com a chegada da segunda onda de contaminação. Hoje sabemos mais sobre o vírus. Conhecemos nossas limitações e quais procedimentos são mais eficazes para evitar a Covid-19, enquanto as vacinas e os antivirais não chegam. Continuamos à espera. Sabemos como devemos proceder e essa solenidade atípica de abertura do ano letivo é uma das medidas mais adequadas para que avancemos com segurança em nossas atividades acadêmicas, mesmo tendo algumas expectativas frustradas. Mas o que são essas frustrações diante da preservação da vida? Desta forma, teremos de nos adaptar, mais uma vez, às atividades à distância e mantermos nossa atenção aos nossos objetivos. Ao mesmo tempo, não podemos descuidar das relações humanas que sempre se mostram sensíveis a estas crises. Manter os laços sociais mostra-se a, mostra a, a melhor forma de enfrentarmos mas este obstáculo, manter os laços afetivos, nunca foi tão importante para a nossa comunidade. Que o distanciamento seja físico, mas que as relações humanas continuem calorosas como sempre. Nós, estudantes, estamos convictos que seremos amparados pelo ICS em nossas investigações. Sabemos que nossas professoras e nossos professores estarão atentos às nossas apreensões e às nossas necessidades. Estamos também prontos a dar nosso contributo para que o Instituto de Ciências Sociais da Universidade de Lisboa dê continuidade às suas atividades, respeitando as novas medidas sanitárias vigentes. Damos, então, as boas-vindas aos colegas estudantes recém-chegados. Sabemos que nossos novos colegas vêm de diferentes pontos do planeta, vêm para diferentes cursos e áreas de pesquisa, vêm em busca da excelência de ensino e da pesquisa característica desta instituição. Nós, estudantes veteranos do Instituto de Ciências Sociais, estamos muito felizes com o ingresso da turma 2020-2021. Este fato, neste ano, mais que em qualquer outro, é para ser comemorado, pois demonstra que não deixamos uh, desanimar diante das limitações presentes. 
Estamos a nos adaptar às novas condições mundiais, assim como os nossos ancestrais o fizeram. Como membro do Conselho Pedagógico do ICS, sei que posso expressar a mesma opinião comungada pelos meus colegas representantes. Estaremos sempre dispostos a ouvir suas dúvidas, suas apreensões e suas sugestões. E juntos, solidariamente, ultrapassaremos os obstáculos que surgirem, pois é isso que estes novos tempos nos exigem. Contem, portanto, com toda a atenção e apoio dos estudantes veteranos. Tragam novas ideias e novas investigações, pois é isso que a vida espera de nós. Muito obrigada. Eu agora passo a palavra ao, ao doutor João Vasconcelos, presidente do Conselho Pedagógico do ICS. Muito bem, Tânia, muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Uh, muito obrigado, Karen, um cumprimento especial à Karen Wall, diretora do ICS, à Ana Nunes da Almeida, presidente do Conselho Científico. Dear Professor Tim O'Riordan, I'm, I'm going to speak in Portuguese. Don't mind, I'm going to... We are very glad to have you here with us today. Um, Tânia, olá a todos. É, é, é ótimo estar aqui a ver-vos, a ver um, um mosaico zoom tão preenchido, que ocupa várias telas, um, e rever tantos colegas e, e, e estudantes antigos e ver também caras novas. Uh, e às caras novas, aos novos doutorandos do ICS, que eu me vou dirigir uh, em particular. Nós estamos a receber este ano, a acolher 42 novos estudantes de doutoramento que ingressam nos primeiros anos do, dos programas doutorais em alterações climáticas, em antropologia e em política comparada, que são aqueles cujo primeiro ano funciona no, no Instituto em 2020 2021. Estamos também a acolher, neste momento, 32 doutorandos que concluíram os seus cursos de formação avançada e que se inscrevem agora no seu segundo ano, em elaboração de tese no ICS. Alguns deles já nos conhecem bem, estudaram connosco no primeiro ano, outros chegam vindos de outras escolas ou de universidades, ou de outras universidades. Bom, boas-vindas a todos, desejamos que se sintam em casa e que encontrem aqui as melhores condições para a vossa formação e para a realização das vossas teses. O ICS é uma escola da Universidade de Lisboa que se dedica em exclusivo à investigação e à formação avançada em ciências sociais e à devolução à sociedade do conhecimento produzido, sobretudo através dos seus observatórios. A investigação e a formação avançada fazem-se aqui em articulação estreita e essa é uma das boas razões para se fazer um doutoramento no ICS. O Instituto participa atualmente na oferta de 10 programas doutorais, com exceção do doutoramento em política comparada, que é o único exclusivamente da casa, os restantes são todos programas em parceria com outras escolas da Universidade de Lisboa ou em associação interuniversitária. O doutoramento em alterações climáticas e políticas de desenvolvimento sustentável, doutoramento em antropologia, em ciências da sustentabilidade, em estudos de desenvolvimento, em filosofia da ciência, tecnologia, arte e sociedade, em história, em migrações, em psicologia social e em sociologia. São esses os programas em que participamos. O ICS participa também na realização conjunta de três mestrados da Universidade de Lisboa. O mestrado em Cultura Científica e Divulgação das Ciências, em conjunto com o Instituto de Educação e a Faculdade de Ciências. O mestrado em Design para a Sustentabilidade, em conjunto com as Faculdades de Belas Artes, Ciências e com o ISEG também. E o mestrado em Estudos Brasileiros, um mestrado conjunto com a Faculdade de Letras. Além disso, e no âmbito apenas da formação avançada, o, o ICS oferece, abre todos os anos, várias escolas de verão e escolas de inverno, portanto, cursos intensivos, eh, pós-graduados intensivos virados, seja para temas e problemas, seja para métodos e técnicas. E o ICS participa também na formação universitária para séniores da Universidade de Lisboa, que é algo que eh, fazemos com muito prazer e que nos orgulhamos muito. Somos uma casa que integra neste momento 123 eh, investigadores doutorados, 67 bolseiros de pós-doutoramento e bolseiros de investigação, 36 profissionais técnicos e administrativos e 180 estudantes de doutoramento, 
de diversas nacionalidades. E, e, e esta é, é outra das riquezas do, do Instituto. Todos os estudantes estão convidados a participar nas atividades dos sete grupos de investigação temáticos em que o ICS se organiza. Os grupos de investigação, os GI, como lhes chamamos, são grupos de debate científico e de troca de experiências e resultados de pesquisa que promovem a integração dos doutorandos nesta nossa comunidade de investigação. O Gabinete de Estudos Pós-Graduados do ICS está ao vosso dispor para vos ajudar em todos os assuntos administrativos. Contem com o acompanhamento da Maria Goretti Matias, da Cláudia Andrade e da Raquel Brito. Obrigado às três por tudo o que já têm feito desde setembro e desde, desde maio e junho, quando começámos a preparar este ano letivo que se avizinhava particularmente difícil e exigente. O Gabinete de Estudos Pós-Graduados um, preparou precisamente preparou precisamente espera aqui que queria, queria aqui fazer ok desculpa lá pronto preparou isto preparou o, o guia do estudante que uh, acaba de ser estará a partir de hoje publicado no site do ICS portanto peço a todos que consultem o guia do estudante para uh, onde poderão encontrar informação muito diversa e, e útil para, um, para vos enquadrar agora neste início de trabalho no Instituto. Um, contem sempre com os vossos representantes no Conselho Pedagógico, além da Tânia, que acabou de falar, a Luísa Coutinho também e o Gustavo Maciel. Partilhem com eles quaisquer dúvidas, críticas, sugestões que tenham a respeito da vossa vida no Instituto. Um, iniciar um doutoramento ou iniciar a pesquisa empírica que dará origem a uma tese é sempre uma aventura incerta e exigente. E eu, particularmente, neste ano zero de uma epidemia global que não sabemos quando terminará. Sabemos como ela nos tem afetado desde março. Às nossas vidas pessoais, às nossas famílias, ao nosso trabalho, à vida em sociedade, à economia. Sem o querermos e sem o prevermos, tornámos-nos nos agentes propagadores de um vírus respiratório altamente contagioso, do qual somos também o alvo. Noutros tempos, juntávamos quando nos queríamos proteger uns aos outros. Juntos sentíamos mais fortes. Agora, para nos protegermos uns aos outros, temos de fazer o contrário. Temos de nos afastar, de nos desinfetar, de manter a distância, de nos, de nos isolarmos, caso necessário. A sociabilidade habitual tornou-se um risco, a proximidade uma ameaça e o afastamento uma prova de respeito pelo próximo ou mesmo de amor. É um pouco o mundo virado ao contrário. Só podemos estar reunidos aqui nesta tarde precisamente porque estamos à distância. Nestas circunstâncias que inicia hoje uma investigação, sobretudo se ela incidir sobre a sociedade dos dias que correm, qualquer que seja a sociedade, e qualquer que seja o objeto de estudo particular, não pode contornar os impactos sociais da pandemia. Este é um desafio que se colocará a muitos de vós, como integrar esta nova realidade em, agente, em agendas e protocolos de investigação que foram desenhados quando o mundo era diferente. Como realizar observação participante, como fazer entrevistas, como inquirir, quando a proximidade interpessoal é uma ameaça. É certo que temos tecnologias de comunicação, sem as, quais, sem as quais provavelmente já teríamos colapsado, sem as quais não poderíamos estar aqui hoje. Mas não vivemos apenas vidas online, e boa parte do mundo nem sequer conhece essa forma de vida. Este ano vai exigir de todos nós mais, imagi mais imaginação e maior capacidade de improviso e de adaptação do que é habitual. O mais sensato será talvez encararmos isto como algo positivo, algo único, que nos está a acontecer a nós e que está a acontecer ao mundo e que temos a oportunidade, enquanto cientistas sociais, de registar para a memória futura e de analisar. Não há receitas feitas para isto, mas saibam que podem contar com os órgãos do governo do ICS, com os investigadores e os técnicos e com os vossos colegas mais antigos para vos ajudar. Por fim, a anuncio que no próximo dia 17, 17 de novembro, pela manhã, haverá uma recepção mais informal aos novos doutorandos, 
a nossa diretora, a nossa presidente do Conselho Científico, os membros do Conselho Pedagógico e as colegas do Gabinete de Estudos Pós-Graduados vão estar disponíveis para vos transmitir mais informação sobre os recursos e os serviços que o ICS e a Universidade de Lisboa colocam ao vosso dispor e também para vos ouvir, aliás, sobretudo para vos ouvir e responder às vossas perguntas. Pronto, anotem nas vossas agendas, dia 17 de novembro, das 11 à 1, o, o encontro fica já marcado, será virtual também, o convite seguirá depois por e-mail. Muito obrigado a todos e bom trabalho. Um, e dito isto, passo a palavra ao meu colega, Rui Costa Lopes, que vai... Muito obrigado, João. Obrigado. Boa tarde a todos. Uh, Cabe-me então agora a honra de apresentar o Prémio Extensão em Ciências Sociais, uh, um prémio ICS, e os seus vencedores nesta sua primeira edição, a edição de 2020. Eu vou compartilhar a tela, quero partilhar convosco esta informação de um modo mais formal. Portanto, permitam-me que antes de uh, anunciar os vencedores, permitam-me que explique um pouco a origem e o, e o funcionamento deste prémio, ex trata-se de um prémio que surge no quadro uh, de um reforço institucional da dimensão da outreach do ICS. O ICS sempre procurou desenvolver uh, a sua atividade em torno de três eixos fundamentais, a investigação, a pós-graduação e o outreach, ou a extensão, e Reconhecendo o um investimento menor neste último eixo, nos últimos anos, o ICS e o seu Conselho de Gestão e o Conselho Científico, principalmente, adotaram então nos últimos anos uma nova abordagem, uh, que passou nomeadamente pela criação da Comissão de Extensão Universitária, em 2019, e esta comissão foi criada com a responsabilidade de monitorizar e operacionalizar a estratégia de outreach do ICS. Essa estratégia de outreach... Uh, um dos pontos fundamentais dessa estratégia no curto prazo incluía então a criação deste, deste prémio dedicado às atividades de extensão e é, isso, e é, um prémio, é esse prémio que estou aqui a, a apresentar-vos hoje. E, portanto, esse prémio foi, assim surgiu este prémio que foi criado com o objetivo de valorizar as atividades de extensão inovadoras desenvolvidas individualmente ou em equipa uh, por investigadores e ou estudantes uh, do ICS e... Foi, é um prémio que é atribuído em três categorias. Uma primeira categoria que visa premiar candidaturas lideradas por investigadores em atividades de comunicação de ciência e divulgação científica. A categoria B visa premiar candidaturas lideradas por investigadores em atividades de extensão para a comunidade, portanto iniciativas orientadas para ou desenvolvidas com a comunidade de stakeholders, e finalmente uma categoria única, unicamente destinada a candidaturas lideradas por estudantes do ICS, que pode incluir tanto iniciativas relacionadas com a comunicação de ciência, como iniciativas relacionadas com a extensão para a, a comunidade. Para esta primeira edição do Prémio X, portanto a edição 2020, recebemos uh, 19 candidaturas, estas 19 candidaturas foram uh, avaliadas por um júri presidido por mim, mas que de resto era composto unicamente por membros externos ao ICS, e para esta edição tivemos a honra de contar com os seguintes nomes. Cristina Roldão, João Vengrovius Menezes, José Vitor Malheiros e Marta Lourenço. Aliás, aproveito para agradecer a disponibilidade e o trabalho destes membros externos do júri, e agradeço também muitíssimo o apoio e o acompanhamento feito pelos colegas Eugénia Rodrigues e Pedro Sobral em todo este processo. O júri então avaliou estas 19 candidaturas e vou então anunciar os vencedores por categoria. Na categoria A de Comunicação de Ciência e Divulgação Científica, o júri decidiu uh, atribuir o prémio ao blog POP, Political Observer on Populism, da responsabilidade do investigador Luca Manucci. Esta candidatura foi considerada meritória pelo seu papel de cidadania ativa, bem como pelo objetivo de comunicação bidirecional, uso do blog e Twitter, numa iniciativa desprovida de recursos financeiros e institucionais. Muitos parabéns ao Luca. Nesta categoria, e unicamente nesta categoria, 
uh, o júri decidiu atribuir também duas menções honrosas. A primeira menção vai para uh, a candidatura Sondagens Isqueté, ICS, Isqueté e UEL, que no ICS é da responsabilidade de Pedro Magalhães, Marina Costa Lobo e uh, Alice Ramos. A segunda menção honrosa distingue a apresentação dos resultados do segundo grande inquérito sobre sustentabilidade em Portugal, da responsabilidade da Mónica Truninger e Luísa Schmidt. Muitos parabéns também a estes candidatos. Na categoria B de extensão para a comunidade, o júri decidiu por unanimidade atribuir uh, o prémio à candidatura Assembleia de Moradores e Caravana pelo Direito à Habitação. Trata-se de uma iniciativa uh, liderada no ICS por Simone Tolomel, Simone Frangela e Roberto Falanga, e ainda também com a colaboração do investigador associado Andy Inch e a doutoranda uh, Rita Silva. Este prémio foi atribuído pela sua originalidade e relevância, uh, através da aproximação entre a academia, grupos historicamente subalternizados, e a colaboração em processo de empoderamento uh, dos mesmos. Muitos parabéns a todos os envolvidos nesta uh, nesta candidatura. Finalmente, na categoria dos estudantes, de candidaturas lideradas por estudantes, o Prémio Distingue, o primeiro ciclo de conferências de Porto de Mós, Tempo, Espaço e Memória. Trata-se de uma iniciativa do estudante uh, Kevin Carreira Soares e uma candidatura que foi premiada por conseguir uma articulação do rigor científico com o envolvimento dos uh, stakeholders locais. Assim eh, termino o anúncio dos prémios, termino agradecendo a todos os investigadores eh, e estudantes que se candidataram à primeira edição deste prémio, eh, com os parabéns especiais a todos os vencedores e convido-vos eh, a estarem atentos à próxima edição do prémio eh, em 2021. Muito obrigado pela vossa atenção, desejo aos meus colegas eh, uma boa tarde e uma boa palestra, passando a palavra à colega Luísa Schmidt. Muito obrigado. Uh, muito obrigada e muito obrigado pela menção rosa. Um prémio é sempre uma responsabilidade e um entusiasmo, e é isso que eu sinto neste momento. Um, então, uh, vou, vou dar aqui início, boa tarde a todos. Uh, vou, vou então começar por, 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 por apresentar o professor Timor Jordan e uh, vamos então começar a nossa conferência. Hello, Tim. It's a pleasure to present you. Uh, Timur Jordan is an Emeritus Professor of Environmental Sciences at the University of East Anglia, East Anglia Norwich, UK. Uh, he's a deputy of, of the County of Norfolk, served as a, as a Sheriff in, of Norwich, uh, and is a Fellow of the British Academy. Currently, he is uh, an Executive Editor of Environment Magazine. Uh, he has edited a number of key books on the, on the institutional aspects uh, of global environmental change, policy and practice. Um, I focus to, to special, uh, I underline two special books, Environmental Science for Environmental Management and with Tim Lenton, um, Addressing Tipping Points of a Precarious Future. Uh, he's also a special advisor to the House of Commons Environment Audit Committee. And uh, moreover, a personal note, uh, Tim is a longtime joyful friend that has sparked an enthusiastic commitment to the environmental, social and ethical issues for all of us. Tim has also been an inspiring, an inspiring, I would say an inspiring light uh since the very beginning of our doctoral program on climate change and sustainable develop, development policies and we really look forward to have him together with us as a teacher phd supervisor and personally because it's very good to see you and to talk to you personally so thank you tim for joining us in this uh, open day and uh, i'll give you the floor i'll give you the 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 no, the, <laughs> the floor, not the, okay. Louisa, how lovely to hear from you, Botard, everyone. Uh, I noticed a number of friends in you 
flip through the screen that I recognize from my many visits to the Institute, both members of faculty and researchers and also students of all kinds, postdocs and research students. So it's a, a family. I always think of ICS as coming into part of a family home and not just simply an institution. And it has special value to me because it's a very high quality research establishment. And I have to say, Rui, that I, though I'm not a perfect Portuguese speaker, Frederick Zilch, Portuguese speaker, I really want to congratulate you on this outreach. The lines that you have there remind me of what I was working with with my students in East Anglia. We created a thing called a passport program where every student was asked to have five qualities that they left the School of Environmental Sciences. You might like to think of this because they're actually in your list. The first one is to grapple with complexity, particularly complexity over the disciplines. So that you didn't have any difficulty about dealing with a physical sciences subject or an ecological sciences subject or a social science or a humanities subject. The second was the ability to communicate to be able to explain what you were trying to do in a language that the person you were speaking to would be able to follow. That doesn't mean to say you say the same words to everyone, you say different words to everyone, but the words have to be relevant to what they want to listen to and how they can respond. The third thing is empathy, that you need to be able to understand that the person you're talking to has their own values and use that word memory, which I saw in your list, a very important word because we are collections of memory. And if we don't watch out, we are bound by them so that we can't always see the future as well as we should because the memories tug us. So empathy is about breaching the memory and making people respond to it by being rather different when they think differently and act differently. The fourth one is the active agent, being able to do something that changes the world around you, but in a way that doesn't make you the boss. It makes you simply the player and allowing them to be the boss. And that takes me to the final comment, which is the one which we spend most of our time with these students, which is about the concept of leadership. And leadership comes from the center. It doesn't come from the top and it doesn't come from the bottom. It comes from the heart. It comes from the soul. It comes from the spirit. And it comes from the center of the being. And if your being is coordinated and at peace with itself, then you can lead. If it's not, you can't lead. You have no capacity to do anything except struggle. So it's one of the reasons why I really want you to appreciate your wonderful outreach program. All of these things are relevant. Now, Claudia, am I able to get a screen share? Because I'm rather keen that I can show my slides. And I think I need you to make me a co-host. Are you on the line that allow me, you, you to hear me? Professor Tim, you can share now, if you wish. Um, I'm looking for some, here we are. I think that will get us. Right, can you um, see all this? I'm going to go to the full screen so that you can see the whole thing. What am I trying to do? Today, I want to bring together two great C's, which are dominating our age and arguably will dominate our decade. The first C is the one which is particularly with us right now, COVID-19, which we knew nothing about a year ago. And the second C is climate change, or I will call the climate emergency, or an easier C is carbon, and that we knew a lot about a year ago, but I haven't done as much as we would like to deal with it. So the idea behind this is to see whether we can learn how to share these two C's through some kind of moral transition. Then the process of doing that become more clear about who we are, what role we play, in maintaining a viable planet way beyond the end of this decade to come, which will end with the formal acceptance of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the formal acceptance of a UN Charter for environmental, biological, ecological, and human rights. Not that 
they have been given much attention recently. Now, what am I trying to do with this talk? So the idea is a lot going on and I'm going to keep it quite short to allow you to ask some questions, but I like to give people a sense of what I'm, the map of what I'm trying to do. My students, my wonderful students in the PhD program have always been introduced to this notion of tipping points. Tipping points are generally seen as something associated with environmental transformation which can be very damaging to the well-being of human beings. Planet is very capable of handling tipping points and has tipped in many, many times over its four and a half thousand billion years of existence. But human beings are not good on tipping points. They struggle when they come our way. But the tipping point that I'm aiming for is not the tipping point of ice and the loss of forests and the methane bubbles coming out of the permafrost, though I will talk about them. It's a tipping point of social transformation. Because the point about tipping points is progressive transformation in a favorable direction. And the big challenge for all of us in the social humanity and environmental sciences is can we create the conditions? Do we know even how to begin to create the conditions that will give the next generation a chance to live in some form of decency and respect and self preservation? Or are we going to bequeath to our next generation that will be around for a year, 100 years from now? So they go right through the 2,100 year barrier, a life that they cannot possibly cope with and will slowly degrade them as human beings. The question is, the second part of the tipping points conundrum is can we make the conditions suitable for them to be able to maintain a peaceful coexistence on a habitable planet beyond 2100. Now what's causing this to become a drama is the entry of COVID-19. And in that context, it's a tipping point as well because it has transformed every aspect of our lives. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on COVID-19 partly because it's still evolving and we don't really know where it's going to go in the next six months, Never mind year and partly because it's on everyone's lips and in everyone's mind. And so we are familiar with it in a variety, variety of ways. But nevertheless, it's telling us about how we can adapt. And one of the great interesting features of COVID-19 is how much we've begun to adapt to outlooks and ways of living, to say nothing of the medical science attached to this particular virus where the understanding in the space of nine months has been extraordinarily rapid at handling the consequences of this particular virus. But the main thing is we've learned to cope with a thing that we would not have imagined six months ago or nine months ago, staying at home, keeping away from each other, no social friendship or identity in terms of direct contact and being able somehow to exist in such a way that the whole process of interaction is distanced. That's not a human condition. And yet that's what we've learned to live with in the space of six months. And for many people, this is a painful experience, but it nevertheless, we're adapting to it. The issues I do want to touch on is what we're learning from the point of view of the political response that may help us to deal with the <clears throat> moral gains that we seem to be achieving are having a very high level of social understanding and recognition of the responsibility of caring for each other. Because what COVID has done is made us behave not just for ourselves, but for our fellow human beings. And the reason why many of you are wearing a face mask is not to protect yourself against somebody else, but also to protect them from you. And that relationship, the face mask is a wonderful example of collective solidarity around a particular medical condition. And we would not have been able to do that kind of thing unless we believed that we also had to care for the person next to us, whoever they were. So that's the reason why COVID-19 is powerful. And both of these two first bullet points raise the word existential. And we use this word and it's frequently referred to by commentators and 
everyone who wants to use this word, it's very commonly used, particularly in relation to climate change, but I use a better word, it is a threat to existence. Existential is actually around the loss of existence. And I think we need to face up to the fact that if we don't do something about these two Cs, then we actually lose the likelihood of permanent existence of the human species in the form that we know it. So existential is not a mild word. It's not a, a comfortable word, but it is a word that needs to have a moral underpinning because without the moral side of dealing with the likelihood of the loss of the human species. And I do urge you to think where the human beings might be in say 1000 years from now. 1000 years ago was 1020. England had not yet been invaded by the Normans, but a perfectly viable society. And if you go back to the Egyptians, 1000 years ago is peanuts in terms of their idea of civilization. And yet it's hard to think of what we might be like in 1000 years time, in the way that the Egyptians ran for three and a half thousand years, but virtually without any form of massive crisis. So I, I do ask us ourselves to realize that the word existential has a meaning within our lifetime and beyond. It's not something which is just in the distant future. The third part is that there are huge barriers for dealing with COVID-19. And I'm not completely sure that we're going to get past this virus, even with the hope of a vaccine and even the hope of new forms of social management. But certainly when it comes to carbon, the barriers to the persistent reduction of personal carbon emissions are very considerable indeed. And we just have to remind ourselves of what this wonderful phrase net zero means. Net zero, which is a commitment by the Paris community to no effective additional carbon coming into the global environment from 2050 on, means that we have to lose nine tons per person per year between now and 2050, which is only 30 years away. And for most of us on the screen, and that's well within our lifetimes, nine tons. And stretching it, we may have lost a tenth of that in the last five years, stretching it. But in most cases, we've added to that burden since uh, 2005, say. So the idea of actually losing so much, and even by 2030, the net zero track requires us to be six tons per person per year, uh, compared with the current 10. Uh, and that's a challenge. So uh, the, the, these are not insignificant issues that when we put them into the context of day-to-day -day life and personal behavior. Then we raise in the green writing the morality of what is a phrase which is used by the Welsh is a piece of legislation called the well-being of future generations. This is central to the notion of sustainable development. If you create a set of conditions whereby future generations have no well being, or where their well being is significantly diminished. And by well being, I mean the security of health, the security of wealth or prosperity, security of social communication and social connectivity, and the security of an environmental world, a world of ecology and provision of the spirit as well as the natural world that gives us the great sense that we are part of a planetary whole. That's well-being, even in its simplest form. And if we undermine all of those or any one of those, we do ourselves great harm. Uh, so having well-being of future generations as a bellwether of what is sustainable development, in my view, is a very critical feature. And I would urge you know, Portugal, to consider this as part of its possible legislation leading up to 2030. And it would be rather, rather nice if one of the outcomes of our combined relationship between myself and the great ICS is a move toward getting well-being in future gener generations as a legislative framework for Portugal to head for in terms of 2030, because it is the yardstick or the bellwether, as I said, of sustainable development. By 
Doing so, we progressively, in my view, move toward the idea of sustainable localism. And that's the bit on the transformational side I was talking about, which takes us toward a better humanity on a viable planet. I'll come to that later. Let's quickly go through, and I will go through this very fast. The students on the screen have seen this before. What we have to bear in mind is that we in human being terms and in earth science terms have lived through a relatively short period of something of the order of 10,000 years of what's known as the Holocene. And inside this zone has been the perfect temperature. This is what I call the Goldilocks of humanity on the earth. The bit that's neither too hot nor too cold, but just right, if you know the Goldilocks story. And what we're doing is we are transforming that perfect arrangement of human, human existence into something which no longer falls back upon itself and stays stable, but shoots off under the pressure of climate change and above all, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions into what is known as hothouse earth. And that takes us into what is the third part of all of this, the so-called tipping point. Here's the earth in its Holocene case, nice, and stable, and it doesn't move around very much in its little hollow. But if you throw it over this edge, it's away. And there's nothing that can stop it from getting to a point where it becomes disastrously and chaotically unmanageable. And the point about the tipping point when it comes to the Earth science side of tipping points and the hothouse Earth is that this, once it starts, becomes progressively and more ever more rapidly chaotic and heading toward disaster from the point of view of human habitability. The technical phrase is positive feedback. The better phrase is self-reinforcing creation of disaster. And here is the notion of what the environmental science community, and particularly my friend Tim Lenton and Will Steffen from the Netherlands, are doing around this. And again, we could spend a lot of time on this, and we tend to see this kind of picture and remarkably close our eyes to it. And yet it is the most dramatic picture when you think about it, because what we do is these great ice systems, which are the ones up here, and even in the space of the last 25 years, there's this absolutely clear cut evidence of a fundamental change in ice stability and ice availability. Likewise, the Amazon rainforest is showing signs of fundamental drying out, not casual, fundamental, speeded up by vast amounts of fire burning created by a president who doesn't seem to care and doesn't seem to understand what the long-term consequences of these things are. And then we have the issues that are never really talked about at all, that the great oceans of the earth, these ones in here and down here on the Arctic, Antarctic, are really showing signs of wear and tear. And so what we're getting is essentially a collectivity of interacting tipping points. And it's the fact that they can become progressively damaging in a very rapid state. Uh, it's widely understood that what we're seeing in this picture here will be well and truly in place by 2100. And most of you on the picture and the screen will have children who are alive at that point and to give them that ill being is not a moral or a sustainable action so this is the reason why i think we need to transform our line of thinking and our action now why are tipping points so interesting again i could spend more time on this but the nice thing about ics it's got it's filled with people who are philosophers and filled with people who are great literary specialists what i like about tipping points, the metaphors, the ways of imagining the future. They give us enormous cap capability of being able to converse amongst each other in a variety of ways to show that we need to create a different outlook on how we relate to the planet around us, the next generation and to each other day by day. So this disconnected combination needs to be reconnected around lots of things called enterprise and endeavor because Tipping points at their best really make us transform. And also what I call encouraging ingenuity. The great pressure point of change is we have to be very ingenious 
if we want to deal with outcomes that we cannot, as of things stand now, fully appreciate. But the downside from the point of view of the right of center political um, establishment and tipping points are not favorable to the right of center political establishments. And I noticed that Rui talked about populism as part of the outreach side is it gives this impression of powerless, of fear, of failing, of pessimism, inevitability. These are not words that populists like to hear. Well, they do if it goes in their direction, but they don't like to hear it in the context of tipping points. And so it re gives rise to the possibility of people not doing anything because they become frozen in some form of powerlessness and ineptitude. They delay what are difficult decisions, and we see this with COVID, where every political party, certainly in the European scene, and particularly in the United Kingdom, have delayed critically, um, and obviously the United States, but I won't go into that. And actually it's relevant for the conference of the parties. Now one coming up, uh, the conference of the party 26, because it creates a sense of non-cooperative behavior, because people just cannot understand how important this is to, can only be dealt with by cooperative behavior. And you don't get the impression that are people approaching COP26 with tipping points in mind, that previous diagram in mind. We may well come onto that in our discussions. But tipping points in the right kind of discussion, and I think the kind of thing that we were talking about with your outreach and my passport idea is about conversing, empathy, and being able to deal with complicated issues where people can handle innovation and new understandings by exploring and by engaging in ways that they wouldn't have done if we hadn't had that facility to enable them to do it. So I would like ICS and to, in many other parts of the world, I know Olivia and I, but you know, is to have every youngster throughout the world having the capacity to be able to engage in conversations around well-being and future generations, creating the idea of progressive tipping points favoring social viable futures. So the green here, the deliberate color, is a conversation of transformation. And to help us do that, we actually need some form of shaking out of our apathy, um, uh, 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 kind of apathy or our willingness to confront these very complicated issues, which we see as part of the human condition. It's very not, it's a very political phenomenon that people hate the idea of taking difficult decisions, particularly if they have to be taken in a hurry. And that's why we need to have this, what I call awe and shock. We need to be amazed at how powerful we are as a human species on this planet now. And we can add to the sea level by as much as a meter and possibly as much as seven meters in the space of a year of 100 years. That's all. And the shock is realizing what that would do to the human habitation of coastal uh, global scene, where more than a billion people are now in line for being taken out of the game. Uh, have, we, have we got anything above a one meter sea level rise? So the idea is we, we're looking around and we see at the bottom of the picture, methane hydrate, which in my view, one of the big unspoken tipping points of this planet, the possibility of chunks of methane becoming liberated from below the permafrost um, and below great big systems of frozen deltas, especially particularly in the northern part of the Arctic areas, the Amazonian savanna, which is on its way, an ice sheet collapse. These are real phenomena. So we need to have that sense that this is where we need to go. And that therefore makes us rethink what sustainability is. And I think one of the issues why I've been so delighted to come to ICS and teach in that class. Well, I don't teach, I listen to the students when I go there. I love what the students have to say. Is that we're actually realizing that sustainability has a different set of meanings from the original Brundtland system. And we're only beginning to realize now just how important they are because it is hothouse earth and COVID and the idea of existentialism or existence failure, which is making us rethink sustainability. And it's also partly to do with the concern over inequality 
an oppression of minorities of all kinds, of which we're seeing large quantities of interest in the last uh, few months around Black Lives Matter. And what we're seeing, therefore, is the beginning of a much more powerful notion that sustainability is some human variation of Guy and Earth, a self-organizing, self-enhancing system, which is wholly restorative and is based as far as possible on the circularity of what we use and what we dispose of and what we reuse and what we recirculate. And it's reliance that we can do an awful lot within a short distance of where we live. We don't need to spend ourselves in global frantic activity, which consumes vast amounts of carbon and takes up chunks of the planet in ways that it cannot take and understand. And so the notion of the eco-community, and I know that in Portugal, because I've worked with my colleagues with uh, very nice research papers on eco-community living in Portugal and local cooperative economies, these things are in existence. And the research that I've done with my Portuguese friends, and João Marato, I see it on the screen, and he's a great friend who has been working with me on this, and his colleague, Alexandra Busset, Busset. Uh, it's because we need to realize that uh, if they stay as they are, they're essentially politically marginal. If they stay as they are, they're essentially socially marginal. But if you actually understand what they're capable of doing, if you understand what they're capable of becoming, and we have that concept of empathetic engagement with people who are really looking for this type of opportunity, there is actually proto-eco communities all over Portugal in all over many different living conditions and different locations. And I think ICS, if I were in your shoes, I would be saying, how can we actually work with this in the context of a self-organizing and self-hancing system of human life on the planet? I think this is a very exciting possibility. It's, and it's being forced by these two big C's driving our existential perspective. The third part, the orange part, is ecological and biodiversity rights. We need some legal framework. That's why human rights law exists. And we need a bio right law or an eco right law. And there was a very famous effort to create the idea of ecocide, a criminal act, when you gave rise to the extinction of a species of a whole ecological system, in the same way as we have a piece of legislation and international law around genocide and even a court to take it into account. We still don't have either a court or a legal framework for ecocide, and yet we're creating it on a daily basis. The commons, of course, are the collective ownership of the planetary ecosystems which keep us alive, and we uh, all the time try to privatize them when we should actually be engaged in social generation of embracing them and making them owned by everyone and the responsibility of everyone. And of course, there's a literature around this, which is very successful, but it's not been translated into political action. And this takes me to the central theme of the new thinking of sustainability, distributive justice, making sure that not people are not only treated well, but people who have been treated badly in the past and are as last in the queue, or people who are last in line, the weakest to the wall, that they're given special attention and special care to give rise to this well-being across all future generations. So if you could just see that picture, the concept of sustainability is changing toward local, well-being, caring, empathy, and above all, survival by understanding that living with this earth as a creative whole will give us at least a chance of running through to 2200 or 2300, which will be quite a challenge. I won't spend much on the time on this, but the history of sustainability has always been driven by these two dramatically different perspectives, though many people try to embrace them. Technocentrism, you can read the words yourselves. I don't need to spend too much on it. This is the language of science, this is the language of political opportunism, this is the language of the military, this is the language of the powerful corporate elites, and this is actually the language of large numbers of people 
in day-to-day -day lives are looking for technology to get us out of the pickle. Electric cars, carbon sequestration, lots of renewable energy. So we don't need to change anything. All we have to do is just get technology to kick in and then we'll be fine. And we don't need to change the patterns of political and economic power because they are the ones that derive that technology in the right kinds of hands. That's a line of thinking and it's very powerful. And if you look at the Green New Deal in the European Union and some of the discussions of the Green New Deal in the United States, it's very technocentric. There's hardly anything around the Green New Deal. It doesn't have those qualities to it. But sitting in here, and this is actually very much part of ICS in my view, has been this ecocentric line, which goes back to the 19th century, self-reliant communities, people like Kropotkin, famous Scottish planner Patrick Geddes, another Scottish planner Ian McCann, the great modern city movement of Europe and indeed from France and particularly in the United Kingdom, and above all the Schumacherian concept of small being beautiful, people living in managing self-perpetuating systems. And um, I remember a wonderful series of lectures in ICS around the notion of great ecological texts, of which one was the text around Schumacher's Small and Beautiful, and Satish Kumar, one of the great champions of ecocentrism, came and gave a presentation on what was being meant by this wonderful phrase, Small and Beautiful, from Ernst Schumacher, and Olivia, bless her heart, gave the commentary on it and did a brilliant job of showing that this Schumacherian notion is actually alive and kicking and still exists in a variety of ways and frankly, in my view, needs to be given a new lease of life. Moving on, because I want to get to the chance for you guys to ask lots of questions or to involve in a debate. What's making COVID such a challenging issue? Now, we're very early on in this pandemic. Nine months is a very short time in one level, but it's extraordinarily long time at another. And many of us find it even hard, we really talks about memory, to think of the times when you were in Benfica with a number of 60,000 other next to you. And that's just one example of thousands which we took for granted. 1,500 people in the same opera house. We took these things for granted. And six months or nine months later, they are way beyond reach. So we need to bear in mind how quickly we've forgotten what um, a non-COVID world was like and how difficult it will be to imagine a non-COVID world in the future, because I'm not sure that will ever be completely the case. But what it did do was in the space of something like two weeks, and we're talking an extraordinarily short space of time between the middle of February and the middle of March, maximum of four weeks, Europe, as we understand Europe, the European concept enable people essentially to shut the whole economy and their lives down for the best part of two months. I won't spend any more time on this because we all went through it, but we did it because we were committed to the vulnerable and to the protection of the health service. A, cope, a coping style is quite remarkable. And then we had in the moral response, a change in the way we define government spending and the protection of jobs and the investment and investment protection of uh, people who would otherwise have lost their income in 10 seconds and placing this huge burden of payments onto an unrepresented and even unexamined future generation because the public sector costs of COVID-19 will go way beyond this decade to come. They are the scale of war spending. And it took 40 years for the war spending of the 1940s to get through the system. Then the third part of this is the notion that we've become, and I've touched on this, so I'm not gonna dwell on it again, this notion of universal health management, that we are acting as individuals in a collective and social regime whereby we are trying to distance, we're trying to mask, and we're trying to be very clean with our side hygiene and sanitation. But there is a very interesting debate, which I touched on at the beginning of our conversation this afternoon, between the epidemiologists and the modelers, 
who are the ones who are giving the predictions of what death rates might be like and infection rates might be like. And this famous R factor, the reproduction factor or the, the, the contagion factor. These are the people who are doing all this work. And then you have the public health people who say, how do we deal with this and testing people and tracking and isolating them? And then you have the behavioral side of this and what do people do when they're given all this information? And what we're finding in the United Kingdom, I'm not going to say too much about what's going on in Portugal, because I'm not so familiar, is that this whole process of public willingness to be bound by the rules is weakening by the day. And I don't think Britain is ever going to get rid of the COVID virus infection rates until we get to the vaccine. And we're talking, therefore, about a permanent threat to the health of the nation at least until the end of the spring, because we've got a winter ahead of us when the virus is much more effective and possibly until any kind of virus vaccine kicks in, which may well be September 2021. And that is a big issue because the weakening of the public resolve is a function of political mismanagement, a function of being tired and fed up with the whole process and a function of this lack of memory that we touched on, which is why I raised it in your discussion around outreach. When we don't, when we remember what it was like without COVID, we need also to remember what it could be like if we didn't obey the rules, which is looking forward and not looking backwards. And so we do have a problem that the scientists are falling out with the behaviorists and they're both falling out with the politicians. And that is the tragedy of the COVID scene in the United Kingdom. And there is no discussion, my friends, of a moral obligation on people to consider how to behave vis-a-vis -vis this particular virus. It's surprising to me that the, medic the theological world has not really got stuck into this at all. And we may well have a discussion of this because it, it's happening, but it's happening in a muted form with very little real public engagement. And what we're beginning to see is this huge change in the regional handling of the virus, whereby some parts of the United Kingdom are getting very badly treated because they are very virus rich, and other parts of the United Kingdom are getting very well treated because they're virus poor. But the virus rich people, the ones who have got the highest levels of infection, are often poor, they're often from ethnic minorities, they live in multiple family dwellings, and they have very poor health because they are the victims of health inequality on a grand scale. And yet we blame them for raising the R rate above one. It's an amazing reversal of solidarity and morality that we're actually turning on people who are the victims of societal abuse and blaming them for creating ill health amongst those who are living. Very, very tragic stuff. And that's why COVID is a big moral question that we're not really dealing with. And the result of that is this kind of what I call grumbling resignation. People begin to realize they're going to have to live with this phenomenon. They hate the whole idea of it. It's not helped by our prime minister saying, I know you're all fed up to the chief with it, and so am I. What we should be saying is, how can we learn from this? How can we become a better society? How can we change our approach to the world? And that's the challenge that we need to go through. I'm going to skip the stuff on common behavior for a variety of reasons. So I want to get to the end of it. But basically, we have a number of ways in which we disengage from our responsibilities for adding carbon to the planet. Our 10 ton world is based upon nine phenomena. We justify it morally. You can read this. This is from research I've done with a colleague of mine in Germany, where the public were confronted with these questions and by and large agreed with it. But it's very interesting that the uh, Lickett scale, those of you know, I'm sure about this social psychology approach, um, came up with quite low figures, which meant, meant that people were uneasy about having to commit themselves to the points that you can see here. But we, you, from, you make it simple and easy to understand that we can live with a high carbon existence and say that we are basically climate change, emergency, uh, engaged people. So we displace our responsibility, we diffuse our responsibility, and we don't really put the consequences clearly into our minds. 
and nobody will ever think too much even about polar bears, never mind the people who are alive today who might be living in 50 degrees temperature uh, by the end of the decade. So that's the reason why we have a very great deal of unwillingness as things stand now and a lack of social engagement, this empathetic element I'm telling you about, conversational engagement to enable people to start transforming their behavior in favor of the reduction in carbon or a lower level of carbon use. This statistic here is very interesting. This was a question in the German study. How do you feel about 10,000 people in German dying because of climate change related heat compared with 10,000 people dying because of COVID-19? And you can see the question was, how much would you take climate change seriously if you were confronted with this comparison that the heat associated with climate change killed the same number of people have died of COVID-19 in Germany this year? And you see that they say, I would 5%, 8% says, I wouldn't do anything about it. That's not my business, I don't care. Another 11%. Probably unlikely I'd make any change in my carbon behavior. 28% said probably wouldn't make a difference. So there you have a total, which is almost half. And then you have people saying, and it's nearly it's over a third, maybe I should put these two together and it was better presented to me. Maybe I should be changing my carbon behavior and changing how I drive and how I eat my house and how I eat and what I do with my consumption from overseas in particular, and a mighty 13% said, having seen that comparison, I realize now there's a world out there that I never saw in connection. That's why I raised you at the beginning, the key to outreach is connectedness, making the connections. And you can see that that is beginning to happen in Germany. And this is a staggeringly interesting graph. These two at the far end, on the far right, our people will be said, you give me that information in that way, and maybe I must get rid of all of those diffusion factors that I've just given you, change them. So I'll come to the end of my discussion and I encourage you to come in and put a conversation. I stress that what I'm saying from now on is not what I call the truth or what will necessarily happen, but what I would like to see us move toward and I really like this outreach that the Rui introduced and what you're doing in ICS because I think this is really where outreach could have a very powerful role to play if the students from ICS and the university connectivity in Portugal generally and indeed in the schools we're not talking just about students over the age of 18 get engaged with the six bullet points or seven bullet points I have here I think it would make a huge difference to the way this current decade will shape up People are beginning to say we've had enough of exist an existential threat. I can't stand it. I don't want to face it. We've got to change it. Now, we made the existential threat something that people could see is turnaroundable. It's manageable. And by doing things which are actually quite pleasurable, because we don't need to drive around everywhere all the time. We don't need to fly to distant places all the time. There are ways in which societies can become local in the Maldives or in Turkey. They don't have to depend upon international tourism. There's a lot of things that we need to rethink around the idea that our existential life is going to be made worse if we continue our high carbon behavior, but it could be altered. And I think people are beginning to raise the issue that was in the previous slide, we've had enough. And there's also this, what I call great awareness, that generations, especially the younger generations, are beginning to realize that this is intolerable and that we've got to live together in a world that doesn't allow it to happen. And so what we're seeing is this inclusivity of those who were normally either politically marginal or non-existent because they're too young or you're not even born, or they're not acceptable or understandable or brought in because they're victims of the way we run a very damaging and oppressive society. But if we include people who are at the far end of oppression and bring them into the lower carbon regime, that would have, I think, a big important contribution to make to the carbon lowering 
from 10 tons to one ton. The point I made, and Olivia, I wrote about in this article for Environment Magazine, every child should be exposed to why we don't be sustainable. What's causing us to resist sustainability? You can read the orange or yellow. I don't need to go through it with you, but we need people to be aware of and be attentive to why the system is failing us when it comes to sustainability. And I think the students in the class who I've learned to love very dearly, they understand this inside out. And I think that's part of the outreach program. If I was in ICS, I'd be challenging us all to say, how can we get that message across through what I call empathetic or conversational empathetic interviewing? Then we have equal leaders, people who are coming out from all walks of life. And leadership, as I told you earlier, comes from the middle of the body, the middle of the spirit. And if they are the ones who are going to make the change, and we need these people coming from the bullet point three, fully in place and fully recognized, and in a sense, the political leaders of 2030 and beyond, we've got to think very differently about economic and social caring. I, I think our society will finally recognize that spending money on care, spending money on health, spending money on nurturing and social support will become part of the new economics of the decade. And there's a lot of discussion about a basic income, the idea of some form of nurturing fund to allow people to be paid for and recognized because they're helping well-being to be ingrained upon everyone around. And COVID, and I, I, I'm very much involved this in my personal activities in Norfolk here, COVID is creating a huge amount of social distress. And I'm sure it's in our part of the world, in Norfolk, I'll just give you three statistics. One is that domestic abuse has gone up by a factor of harm by young people, particularly young women, has gone up by a factor of tenfold in the last six months. Loneliness and the onset of dementia has happened amongst older people and has gone up by a factor of three in the last 10 months. We're talking about a society which is breaking down because COVID has created conditions of isolation, despair, and lack of any kind of surveillance over what's going on in the inner corners of a damaged domestic setting. And we're going to see new coalitions because of this between business, government, civil society, and these eco communities I talked about, because that's going to be the way a business defines, and a number of us are working in British Academy on what businesses post-COVID will look like and what governments post-COVID will look like. And I'll come on to the localism in a minute. And I think we're going to have a new wave of nature towns, towns which are connected by nature so that people don't have to travel to enjoy nature, that they can enjoy nature on very low carbon cycling or walking or any other form of exercise. And that we can have communities where health becomes central in what is known as a 15 minute city. Most things are within walking distance, more or cycling distance. Um, we are just beginning to realize how we need to redesign planning and settlement and structures of, of human relations to allow for this to happen. And I think one of the great challenges of COVID and of the climate emergency is that what I call that ingenuity of new ways of looking at the world. So I'm going to leave you with this and then hopefully we'll have a bit of a conversation and I did promise you to try to keep this below an hour. I would love to see ICS champion the notion of sustainable localism. I know that Olivia is probably going to say something in a few minutes and I'm sure that she will have very bright and sensible and wonderful things to say. Sustainable localism is about getting rid of populism. It's about getting rid of right-wing narrowness of thinking. It's about getting rid of individualism. It's about getting rid of short-term selfishness. It's the idea of communal connectedness, trust, cooperation, and relationships which can be relied on. And the most wonderful relationships are the friendships that you know you can rely on even if you argue, you can depend that they will still be a friendship of lasting value. How important is that to us all in a COVID age? Massively important. It's where well-being flourishes. 
and particularly around family and neighborhood companionship. And I'm working with the parishes of Norfolk to create what we call good neighbor settings where people can share with each other how to cope with this uh, very, very nasty period of their lives. Personal security in all settings, above all mental health and support. This is, a, in my view, a completely unexamined phenomenon. The scale of which mental health is deteriorating is really quite frightening. And this is specific, particularly the case for those who are young and for those in marginal social circumstances who are disenfranchised in a variety of ways. And the outcome of that is either social threat and social disobedience, or it's the worst of all things where people just disappear into a world of drugs and alcohol and become non-entities. And that would be a tragedy for the human existence. Na nature surroundings, I mentioned that, so I'm not going to say more than that. Create a solidarity so we actually provide this is a central part of what is the new economy. I would love for us to essentially ditch the idea of gross domestic product and start going into well-being indices and make them really function. And my friends in the Institute of Fiscal Studies in England are actually turning their minds to how to make this part of the next phase of economic studies and economic yardsticks. Mobility this time being not mobility with lots of distance, but mobility by, by being local and non-carbon and socially supported. And you can see that this goes on. So I leave you with the wonderful picture that comes from the mayor of, I don't know if I can get the, um, sorry, I'm going to have to go back. If I can do that, I probably can't now. Um, the mayor of um, France, Paris, um, Anna Gildego, she produced this wonderful, wonderful image of a 15 minute city. And when you look at a picture like that and you say to yourself, well, that's you know, a dream, it's the kind of thing that Schumacher wrote about, it's last, the last century's thinking, not at all. This is the middle of this century's thinking. What we need is more like Patrick Geddes, a great Scottish pioneer, planner, architect, and ecologist, who said that the world is at its best when you don't have to move very far for all the things that you best desperately want and which gives you joy, nurture and sufficient prosperity to coexist with each other in a sustainable manner. So my friends, that is the message. The great two seeds can come out as a fork in the ground. One line of the fork is destitution and breakdown and existential annihilation taken to its logical outcome with no intervention. And that's COVID and carbon acting in a variety of ways in a nasty and pernicious manner. Or the great notion of sustainability, well-being, survival, and above all, the notion of solidarity, that we can share this. And when we come out of it, our friends are all around us. They're not just the small number of people that are but everyone you see in every part of your life is your friend, your neighbor, your reliable companion. Now, these things are in our hands. We just need to start thinking creatively and we can go to the second within this decade if we apply our talents accordingly. So that, my friends, is sustainable localism in its full glory. I'm going to go back to the full picture and wish you well. Thank you for listening and putting up with me for so long. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. Um, and to comment, to comment your presentation, we have three colleagues, uh, two personally and uh, Viriato had to tape it uh, because he's giving a lecture. Uh, but um, I will I will uh, pass the the the, the screen <laughs> to I will present is Olivia Bina Olivia everybody knows Olivia Bina is our colleague at ICS and then Sofia Santos Sofia Santos she is uh, an economist she used to be the general Secret secretary of the Business Council for Sustainable Development and she's now working with the 
ISEG, the, the economy, economic uh, faculty uh, for the sustainability issues. Uh, and also Viriat, everybody also knows Viriat, our colleague from Very well. Letters. But uh, I'll give the screen, not the floor, the screen to Olivia to start this comment. Olivia, where are you? Oh, uh, there. Right next door, going to yes. my screen. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you so much, Luisa. Thank you, Karen, for the invitation to, to join in in the festivities of opening the academic year. And, and what a year, indeed. Um, so I will try to follow on, Tim, you've given, uh, as, as ever, a formidable uh, set of ideas and a lot of optimism, which I love. So I'll, I'll dampen that and be terrible and just add a few ideas and try to add free, free links to what I picked up as your, some of your core uh, concepts. Uh, which is the idea of tipping points uh, that you have uh, developed in, in different, both in the positive and the negative, and the underlying need for transformative change, which is uh, perhaps the latest fashionable term, but speaks to a tradition of decades, uh, even going back to our very dear uh, Ernst Schumacher, to mention one great giant of the last century. So, let me try and say as rapidly as possible to give space for a Q&A, uh, three things. The first is, I would like to suggest a sort of complementary way to discuss the, the idea of tipping points uh, around both climate change and COVID, which is what you've used to, uh, to develop um, the ideas presented. And the complementary way would be to think of, that, of tipping points in relation to crises through the relationship, the human nature relationship, tradition and arena. And uh, using COVID as a, as, a, as, a, as a starting point, I'd see five very um, compelling, in my view, processes that center uh, on human nature relationships and that are, of course, echoed by decades of science and climate change. As you rightly point out, COVID is new, but climate change science is not. And there is an enormous overlap in what we can learn. The five things very quickly are the first, and uh, uh, the first is basically a devastation of our planet that is made visible um, through the, the loss of life systems and their life maintaining diversity. The reference to the sixth extinction, uh, um, the loss of biodiversity that are all resulting from extractive and instrumental ways of understanding the relationship between human and nature is central both to climate change and to COVID today. The second point is the systemic homogenization of the structure of life. Um, the aggressive pursuit of monocultures has been very central in COVID, but it is um, the result, it is the symptom of economies of the pursuit of economies of scale and much more to do with our mainstream dominant economic systems that have led what, in what we now all know are, are labeled zoonotic pathogens. A uh, third point, um, which you've mentioned, I want to mention it because it's so, so central to both our work research and to the topic is that uh, I think nothing like uh, COVID has been able to bring home concretely what we mean for what we have meant for decades when we speak of the interdependent and the interconnected systems out there on which our life depends. And the tipping points image that you've shown is all about that. Fourthly, uh, and you've pointed this, uh, pointed to this, I want to highlight it for its depth of significance to the Institute of Social Sciences is that COVID has revealed the reach and the depth of inequality and of structural oppression, which again links to much of the ethos that I've mentioned before of the unrestrained uh, extraction and profit pursuit that shapes our human nature relationships 
but also affect large sections of the human society and uh, Black Lives Matters uh, in the absurdity of that expression that we should even have to frame it is a point here. And finally, the and you mentioned this also, and I want to pick it up because of course it's very close to my heart, the unpreparedness or the uh, unwillingness that would be worse um, to think across communities of, and disciplines. Um, the way we frame the problem of COVID and the way we're framing the solutions is partly flawed and reflects our inability to speak across communities and disciplines. So that was my first point. But the second point linked to this is that as you appeal to transformative change, um, I would suggest that one major step also reflecting from where we are, at least, uh, um, at least professionally, our academic institutions, is a need to recover epistemological pluralism as a condition to reframe those nature relationships, human nature relationships that I've just um, pointed to as processes that undermine our capacity to turn those tipping points into positive ones. So you have presented a, um, a beautiful moral and transformational response on points of well-being for future generations through sustainable localism. And you've highlighted, and that is for me so central, you've highlighted that that can only happen if we also acknowledge that this is intrinsically tied to the well-being of ecosystems and to the acknowledgement of ecological or biological rights and the likes. And that to me entails a, a renegotiation of what we might call, um, a, let's say the ultimate goal of our socioeconomic systems. And in sustainable development goals, we, we've struggled with, is there an ultimate goal to the 17 goals? And your proposition in a way is a framing that answers that and says, yes, what we aim ultimately for is that human well-being, but it's also intrinsically linked to ecosystem well-being. So either way, um, human nature relationships remain central to that. So in the second point, my, my suggestion again is that to renegotiate those goals and that ultimate goal, which on which your proposition, I would say, depends. We also need to re reopen uh, epistemological plural to epistemological pluralism in institutions like ours if we want to be to contribute to that transformation and that shift. So my third point is that. I would like to conclude also appealing to the work that I've had the delight to do with you, sharing the, the writing and editing of this special issue on the future of university. And uh, to say that our teaching and our research, and so speaking also to our students and our many PhD programs here, um, have a major leadership role to play in all of this, in enabling this. And, I would like to see at least, I'd like to finish on three things that I think I'd like to see more of us engaging with as a community of science um, and which comes out a little bit of our joint work, which is one is the abandonment of this both divided, mutilated as Spinoza once said, um, knowledge and epistemologies, but also the colonized epistemologies that we still um, maintain in academia today and that underpin the human nature divide, which I've pointed to as one of the drivers of our potentially negative um, tipping points. The second point I'd like to see more of, and you've mentioned this, uh, so let me reinforce it, is can we promote more, um, more decisively the sustainable development capabilities that have been theorized and illustrated for decades, uh, but we're still not putting them at the center, let alone the qualities that you've mentioned um, in relation to outreach. And finally, 
uh, and the embracing of an ethos of transformative and embodied learning, which again has been very well rehearsed in manuals for new pedagogies, but is very is still not practiced enough. And I think at ICS we are shifting and we can do more. And certainly as a university, we can do more and better. So that was my take on your wonderful contribution today. Thank you, Olivia. Look up the garu. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, now, uh, Sophia, Sophia, I give you the, the screen, please. Tá, tá, não está ligado. Sofia, yeah, nisto. No, yeah. Well, Tim, first of all, thank you for your, your talk. It was really inspiring. And thank you for inviting me to be here. I feel like a different animal in the room uh, because uh, my background, I'm, I'm, well, I'm from economics and I've worked um, over the last, well, I did the undergrad uh, economics degree on 23 years ago in Portugal. And, uh, and I work in a bank in the, in the UK. Um, then I moved back. And it's always, I always have the same feeling, which is there are, of course, there are different worlds, but there is a, a, a massive gap between this conversation we had here today and the conversations of those that make this, the political and economic decisions. decisions. And I'm afraid, I, I, I'm, I'm very negative nowadays. And if we don't put those people into these conversations, we are just not going to make it. And, um, and, and the issue is because of, you know, the way we learn economics and the way we learn leadership is nothing related with what you said. And um, And therefore, I think there is a massive need to join these two worlds together. And, um, and, and it's all up to schools to do it. And I really don't see how we can speed up because we really need, you know, we, we really need change to happen really fast. I really don't think we need, uh, you know, uh, being carbon ne neutral is not enough. We should be talking about being carbon negative. Because, you know, if we, the Paris Agreement said it, it will take place, well, the goal of the Paris Agreement is to avoid temperature to go up more than 1.5 degrees. And the world, and at the, in the Mediterranean area where we live, the temperature is already up 1.5. In Africa, is already up 1.5. And around the world, the whole world is already up one degree. So, it is bizarre that the Paris Agreement only wants us to, you know, the, the world temperature to not go up 1.5 by the end of this century. It doesn't make that sense because, well, we are already there. We are already there, uh, which means that something is not right. I mean, I, I'm not a scientist. I just read what the scientists uh, write. And if in the Mediterranean area and in, if, if, if in Africa, we are already, one or 1.5 degrees up, and generally the world is one degree up, how the hell is the goal just to be 1.5 in the, by the end of uh, the century? So I really think we should not, uh, you know, being carbon neutral is a massive change and challenge, but probably it's not enough. Probably we really, what we really need is to be carbon negative. Well, as from the economic side, from the economics area, most of the people that I you know, talk with, um, mm, they don't really see, or well, they see the urgency, but um, mm, maybe they don't see that the change needs to be done by them. Or even, even you know, the high corporations, they at the end of the day, well, maybe we should wait for regulation to come. So it's, I, don't, I really don't see how we can speed up these conversations and how can we speed up change. If, you know, if nowadays most of the managers, if nowadays even most of the politicians um, 
they really don't um, feel the need to adapt immediately because we can adapt immediately with COVID. We were things that eventually in other situations would take years to, to, to change in our schools, universities. Come on, universities are the universities are one of the most conservative institutions. It's, universities, it would take years to move everything online. And then in one month or two, everything went online. So uh, government, same thing. Can we imagine that suddenly all the ministers would meet online? Uh, but that took place. So the thing is, we as humans, we can change fast, only if we feel the need and the urgency. And the thing is, we don't feel the need and the urgency related with climate change. Um, not yet, because otherwise the world would have changed. The only people that actually feel the need are people from Africa, um, uh, where they, you know, they already don't have that much food. It's really difficult to, to live in Africa. It's hot. And uh, it's not just hot for the for, for people from, from, from the north side of the planet. It's really hot also for the people from, from the south. So it's difficult to live in those countries. And, and with, the, with the climate change, of course, uh, they are even having more trouble with food and deforestation. So they are actually feeling. Uh, those are the ones with urgency for us to change. But we are you know, in another, another hemisphere with all the comfort we still have. And so we don't really feel the need to change immediately. Uh, so when I, you know, when I am in these conversations, uh, I realize that, um, well, I think the whole economic model is wrong. And most of the economic universities are teaching something completely out of date. And I really don't understand how is, how is, was it possible to take philosophy and psychology out of management and out of uh, economics? because it's all about people and it's all about how our brains work. And, um, and we, just don't, we just don't know enough about ourselves. I mean, we, the school doesn't teach us about ourselves. Universities, they teach us you know, uh, skills, uh, analytical skills. Uh, they teach us you know, how to do a questionnaire. They teach us how to do a, a regression. Uh, universities teach us how to how to write a PhD, which is really difficult to do. Um, but uh, only very specific universities actually teach us about understanding how our brain works and how, to, how important it is to cooperate and how important empathy it is in all of this. So if we don't learn uh, that uh, empathy is important for economic decisions, if we don't learn this, we will never be able to feel the need to care for others. And if you don't feel happiness in taking care of others, why the hell would you, you know, stop um, buying a different car? Or why would you be concerned with your own CO2 emissions if you don't feel any pleasure of taking care of others? So, you know, just to, to wrap up, <laughs> Uh, this first round, um, I think we, as humans, we really need to understand much better about uh, how we think and how our brain is not our best friend, because we actually need to, 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 to avoid the patterns. We actually need to understand that we are not now we are not animals anymore, and that we sh there are not, there there are an, lots of other feelings and emotions that, as human beings, they should be at the center of the decisions. And the way we have learned how to be a great economist or how to be a great CEO is nothing related with the future that we need. It's all about it's all related with the past that brought us here, and nowadays. Most of the schools are still teaching uh, you know, economic decisions and managerial decisions based on the past. And it's a great challenge to try to include sustainability and, 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 uh, and sustainable development goals uh, uh, and, the, and the idea of caring and the idea of that an economical model is all about caring the origin of economics. It's all about taking care of our home um, and how throughout the time, uh, economics became just make money 
and um, and of course uh, uh, all the heart and all of the the real what really matters in economical system which is all about how people behave um, was completely forgotten and and we end up having a system uh, where decisions are based on 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 the money that we are able to generate in the in the short term so uh, finalizing i think um, you know, courses like based uh, based uh, the economics management and uh, and financial related courses they should include uh, philosophy uh, because people don't they, they are not used to uh, to to think about the why. Even when I work with companies as a consultant, sometimes I ask why, and they look at me. They never thought about the why. So we need to understand why are we doing this and not something else, and why not. That's another thing. It's the why and why not. Uh, so, and in order to do that, we need to open up uh, our brains to to understand about um, other types of theories. Because most of the economists, I am an economist, and I say, I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't learn that much at school. <laughs> uh, it was we don't really understand the theory behind what people are teaching us. And uh, if we really understood the theory behind, uh, maybe we wouldn't like to be to, to learn that kind of message. So that one side, another thing is psychology and, and trying to understand how we think and trying to understand how we should communicate with each other. Empathy, it's all about empathy. We should communicate with each other, not, uh, not using my own words, but actually using someone else's words. We need to learn how to reach the other person and reaching the other person is not having me uh, speaking with my own uh, language, but it's, it's having me understanding how, what is the language that the other person will understand. And this is a lot of effort, but it needs to be done if we want to cooperate. We learn at school that we should be competitive. And, uh, 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 and that's a completely different story from where we are now. Um, and in order to, to cooperate, uh, we need to engage and we need to communicate in a much better, better way. And finally, uh, when it comes to leadership, I completely agree with you. Uh, leadership is all about uh, what you have in your soul, um, how can you inspire others, um, but well, Recently, I think we can see a shift in terms of training, what leadership is. You can see a shift towards this type of direction, but still it's, it needs to be much more focused on, 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 on the conscience and on the heart, and then the decisions will come up out of this connection. And um, for economists, it's really difficult to say, I'm going to, I should be taking this decision because this is the right thing to do. Um, but uh, I really agree with you that uh, moral should come in much often because at the end of the day, there are things that they are not good. To, there are things that no one would like to see it done. And there are other things that are for the common good um, and sometimes are very simple things. Um, so this was my, these are my first uh, thoughts about all of this conversation. And uh, it would be interesting to have more, if there are more economists in the room, uh, I really would like to hear from them as well. Thank you. Sophia, Thank you. I think that was wonderful. Totally wonderful. And I think that you should give the lecture next year. <laughs> I agree. No, you, you're Thank the you. voice that I'm listening to. I think we need to have this discussion. We need people like you in the economics profession because you're the voice that can be heard by them, but you can also change them. So I want to congratulate you. The way you put all of that was more, more powerful than the way I put it, but it was in the same direction. I, I know I'm, we're having one more intervention, Louisa, but I did want to say that the issue of whether we can get past this period or not, this is what you call the gap, Sophia, whether we actually achieve anything. It's very easy to fall into, I feel a trap of saying nothing can be done, we're all doomed. But I actually feel very importantly that optimism is part of the notion of leadership. When you have that sense that something can be done, you're not put off when people say it can't be done. That's not the language you want to hear. And when you empathize with people, you empathize with people under how can we make something work, even if it's only a small step. 
what I'm doing in Norfolk, I won't say anymore, because I know Louisa wants me to get, get really out of on there, but I've learned from my work with parachutes at the local scale in, this, in, in Norfolk, the smallest of small steps have a huge influence on people. They can actually see that something can be done by them and with others. And then it's easy to take the next one. The hardest step is the first. We've all known that, but in this particular context, very much so. But I do want you to keep going. What you were saying right now is spot on. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll speak in Portuguese. Uh, Karin, achas que é de pôr o, o vídeo do Viriato ou, ou fazemos já o debate? Não estou a ouvir, Karin, não tens o microfone ligado. Karin? É... Como tu achares, se achares, acho que é melhor pôr o, o, o vídeo do Viriato, não é? É capaz de interromper um bocadinho tá então, a dinâmica, não é? Então, okay. mas como é que podemos fazer? Vamos discutir, debater agora e depois ouvir o viriato? Acho que é melhor. Tá Tim, bem. we will have now our debate. I think it's a good idea because as Viriato is not here, he taped the, the, his speech. I think it would be more interesting to have now our debate. And then, um, and then we can hear Viriato later. Otherwise, it will interrupt the dynamic of the session, I think. Uh, so if you want to comment, Olivia, a little bit more, Olivia and Sophia, you have already done it, but if you want to say something more about what they have said and the challenges that they, uh, they, they bring to this, to this, uh, to this uh, session. Well, I've already commented on what Sophia, because Sophia put it so well, that there's still a mindset of, I, I like what Rui said, memory, this word memory means more to people than people realize. It's a wonderful sociological word, but actually has a very powerful phenomenon. Memory can be very constructive, but it can also be very destructive. What Sophia was saying is that the economic memory can actually be damaging, but, the, uh, but if we can become more open-minded by empathetic conversation, I don't really want to speak much more, Louisa, because I feel that I want to hear what other people are saying. The point I'm really trying to get is that I think COVID, despite what people are saying, will provide such a devastating outcome for the viability of, the, of people's living on the planet. It's a, it's a funny thing, COVID. It's actually a human impact rather than a big ecological crisis of the kind that we see with the global crisis. Is actually affecting humans rather than ecology. In fact, in many, some ways, the early part of COVID saved a lot of mucking about with ecosystems. But I think the point that we're all making is it's the world that COVID could be creating is up for us to do the things that we're talking about, whereas it might not have been otherwise. And that's why, to give one example, we're in, in our power, I know I'm saying a lot about my parachute, but it's a big deal for me. And I spend my time with 772 parachutes in Norfolk. They go all the way back to medieval England. But what's important is where people live, where they live and what they do with each other. We're saying to people, in COVID, you only shop once a week. Carry on doing that. And we've got a, a, a carbon reduction tool which shows that if people stop driving every single day to shop, which is what most people do, they could cut their carbon burden by 10%, just like that. Now, once you made that decision, you realize it's not a big step. And it all makes altogether changes the way people see their world and the world of, 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 of consumerism. Now, I don't want to spend time on this type of thing, but what, that's the kind of issue that COVID can begin to create, a sense of collective endeavor around a changing way of life that actually is environmentally and socially supportive. That's what we need to learn from. That's what I was saying at the latter part of my talk. So there is a link between COVID and carbon, but we're not making it in the political world, and ICS and the world that you represent, you, you, everyone in this screen, could do it and should do it. There is a, a chance for the making, and that's what I'm really getting at. Well, we have already some questions, and I, I, if, if someone wants to ask something, please write it to the bat pap, and then I'll, I'll give the floor. Now, Anna, Anna Nunjda Almeida, she wants to make a question. Hey. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? Well, it's nice to see you. <laughs> yes. This time it's not a, a panel or a jury. <laughs> it's no, a conversation. Not. It's yes. another kind of conversation. 
Right. Very happy to see you. Uh, and I, my question, well, uh, at the very beginning, you pointed out that we were living uh, in a kind of non-human condition with COVID-19. And uh, at the same time, you, uh, you pointed out that memories are extremely important to create that empathy with the, uh, with, with the others, with the otherness. But memories for the social sciences are important to uh, put in view what we are living in. And uh, what I would like to uh, say is that, well, we were not the first in the 21st century to live in a non-human condition. Uh, let's think about other, uh, other geographical spaces. There are people living under war, uh, children dying from hunger, and so on. So in space, uh, in, in, on Earth, there are many, many examples outside Europe and even inside Europe. Just, uh, uh, just think of the people drawn in the Mediterranean who do not live in human conditions. But if you look at the past, the same. For example, the generations who went through the two world wars, where the uh, the where there was a, a total disruption of uh, societies, well, they uh, they they also were uh, living went through that experience. So my question to to you would be, uh, in which ways does the knowledge of other contexts or non-European context, for example, or the knowledge of the past can help us to be, to understand what we are living and to be resilient and continue to move on and create those sustainable localisms. That's it. There's a wonderful question, Anna, and basically I made the comment, and I fully agree with you that all over the world, history as well as contemporary, there are people living in what you would call non-human conditions. Uh, that's so evident in so many ways. But the point I'm making is that sustainability is now beginning to embrace the, that change, that element of our empathy and understanding is intrinsically part of the sustainability outcome. So my, my sort of jokey phrase is that the vaccine for climate change is sustainability. Mm -hmm just like there's a vaccine for COVID-19, or there may be or may not, but the only vaccine for climate change or the climate emergency is sustainability because it addresses the very things you're talking about. The people on the margins mm -hmm. who are going to be under seawater, or are going to be in temperatures of 54 degrees, or who are simply not going to be able to have food of any kind to eat in any decency. They, that cannot continue. And that's why I asked the question of you, what would society be like in 1,000 years from now? It's the same as it was 1,000 years ago in England. And I think the question is, it, it could be virtually non-existent as we would understand the human condition, except for a very small number of people. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to get into that, but that is basically what I call the existential crisis. What I'd much rather say is we've got a time between now and 2030 where we bring together and remember in the comment made for 2030, there is a thing called ecological rights, human rights, bio rights, ecocide. Those ideas are going to be brought up into the debate leading to 2030. 2030 is not just about climate change. It's not even about the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the bias, biodiversity side of all of this. It is actually increasingly about the notion of equality, opportunity, and decency mm -hmm. of coexistence. And that's always been part of the sustainability message, but now we have to really change it. And all I'm saying, and I've said it in my talk, so I'm not going to repeat it, COVID provides for the first time a hit to the wealthy, to the better off, who have in the past yeah. not bothered about all of this. So the kinds of people you talk about mm -hmm. tragically have always, not always been, but have mm -hmm. been marginalized and not been any more than seen as you like as victims and the downside of a society that we care not to think about. But we're now 
the people who have been doing all that are now in the front line. They're getting this treatment. They're losing their jobs. They're losing their mental health. They're losing their capacity to have their loved one visit them when they're dying. COVID mm -hmm. is taking people out in a whole host of ways. I think that gives us an opportunity to reassess the notion of social solidarity, which is why mm -hmm. I'm making the point I'm making. Make it a moral question. The politicians need to bring these two together. Then the two C's can coincide. That's not what we've done up until now. So my answer to your question, Anna, is we need to learn from that history, but realize there's another set of players involved. And that gives us an opportunity that we didn't have when we were addressing this, say, 20, 30 years ago, when we should have been tackling this thing, when Brunton first wrote their report in 1987. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. Great question. Uh, Tim, um, I have a question. I'm here oh. and I have the right to have a question. I don't think, and it's a polemic question, because I don't think we can achieve sustainability without a strong investment in improvement of science and technology. And that doesn't necessarily mean technocentrism. Uh, it means maybe a clever optimism, I don't know. I don't know if it's clever, but it's an optimism. If we don't transfer technology for energy production to poor countries, and talking about global south, for instance, um, we don't create a basis for hope for sustainability. And this, um, and this is, I know that is polemic, but I think that we need more, we need a different um, attitude to technology, and we need technology for sustainability. And you were saying that Green Deal it's uh, technological centric. And I think they're right. And I want I would like to hear your opinion about this. Well, I, the, the, of course, I mean, you, I, I don't want to over, I mean, I said I started by saying that I would, I'm to some extent wrong. It's, I don't want to be too didactic. It's very dangerous to be sweeping. Of course, there are bits of modern technology which can be fantastically important and are proving fantastically important, not least a mobile phone in the hands of people in Africa who couldn't otherwise communicate. There's lots of reasons why there's good technology. What I'm driving at, what I was getting at, is that big technology in the so-called green line is what is potentially damaging because it reinforces given structures which are not favorable to the idea of sustainability. That's what I was trying to get at. So nuclear, from that point of view, large amounts of nuclear is not going to happen, but it, if it did, would be of that ilk. But it is important that we've got renewable technology on a scale which we can meet. If we're going to have electric vehicles, we need vast quantities of renewables. Um, the big question is where do they go? Now, it's not so bad in the UK when we have lots of sea to, to put our wind farms in. But for you in Portugal, you rely either on hydropower or lots of um, solar. Uh, it's fine. What I'm driving at is that the, the, it's very, you can't generalize on this. There's a solar power technology, which is not quite there yet, which is at the level of the house scale, you know, the dwelling, which could give us all the energy we want to live on, electricity we want to live on at the house level. That can be done. Within 10 years, we'll have that. In Portugal, it would be a wonderful. So that anything from hospitals to hotels to restaurants can have their own solar system. We don't need the grid. So I'm not against technology, Louisa. What I'm really was saying is that the Green New Deal is big technology. That's the reason yes. why I worry about it. And, and, and it's, it's, it's only now beginning to realize it needs to change into this so-called just transition. <clears throat> there are, I never raised this because it's a big thing for me, but the just transition is becoming the center ground of the net zero debate. And that's where you have to deal with people who otherwise will lose a job when they go out of their carbon dependency. So the answer to your question is that the Green New Deal does have large amounts of it, which is very favorable, but we shouldn't just absorb it as if it is a given. We need to be much more careful about what is the purpose of the Green New Deal. In America, I think that the people there have got further along the line of what you might call a, a localizing social version of a Green New Deal, not very popular amongst the American right, but actually surprisingly popular amongst young people and people like Sophia, I suspect, would be very favorably inclined to the way the American young people are addressing Green New Deal. So I don't want to give the impression that Green New Deal is wholly bad, but it needs to be channeled into the lines that I'm, frankly, I was talking about in this lecture. Then it's fine. 
Okay, now I, I have here Paul Miguel who wants to a, a question and then we have to move to, I don't know if Sofia or Olivia want to add something at Paul, uh, because Claudia yeah. was telling me that Paul, yes. Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm hoping the, the, no, the I'm hoping the video, okay. yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I would like short to... Short comment, a short comment. Um, well, first, the, the, the question. Uh, for for Timothy, I, I um, liked very much your presentation, and it was um, kind of inspiring. Um, I tend to agree with your view that we need a kind of uh, sustainable localism, and um, uh, although technology is important to to some extent, I think I I'm not uh, uh, well. I understand the problems with big technology, but I think we need some kind of technology, technology innovation in order to make this just transition. But my, my question was if, um, well, this is a presentation for a kind of converted audience that uh, tends to agree with you. My, my question is, have you been presented presenting these uh, ideas to other kind of public, namely economists, politicians, and uh, if so, if yes, how how are the reactions? Uh, well, this question was um, came to my mind because of uh, Sophia's comment, uh, and because uh, it was also very surprising for me. I have also some experience of dealing with economists and managerial professions. And uh, I tend to agree totally with you. Uh, although uh, not everybody is like that, the, the, the people that are on the positions that make the key decisions, I, I think it's more or less like you said, and it's not uh, very common to hear to the public, to put it so clearly. Uh, well, uh, my comment is on, on that because I think that uh, as a social scientist, we need uh, to engage more with the economics uh, theory and the economists and the economic academic thought, uh, because I think that there are a lot of problems with the contemporary mainstream economic uh, uh, thought. And uh, as social scientists, I think we also have an, uh, a responsibility to engage in a discussion with, with their thoughts and to point out their uh, weaknesses. Let's put it that way. I, I think that they are not very receptive because some of these economists, they, I think they, they see themselves as a kind of a case inside the social sciences, but mm -hmm. uh, reinforcing it. I think we, we should engage more in that discussion. Thank you. Okay, Paul. Tim. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I agree with all that you're saying, but and I actually made a, a slightly flippant remark, but I'm, I think I'm actually going to make it take it seriously to create some funding for a prize for ICS for at least one example of an ICS researcher speaking to the general public or to somebody who's not their own peer group as part of this transformational debate that I heard from uh, Olivia and elsewhere, and I firmly believe in this. I speak a lot to community groups in Norfolk. And these are community groups which are now beginning to realize, of course, we're doing it by Zoom now. It's not very easy to do and, and I can't do it but any other way. But it is actually important to realize that people are now beginning to realize that there's a world of change that they're going to have to embrace. I touched on the great awareness in my series of comments, Paolo. And I don't think we should underestimate this, this notion I use of human adaptation to COVID is a, is a fascinating notion. People are getting used to things that they've never thought about nine months ago. I won't go into them, but some of them are self-evident. But also people need to realize that the, a new kind of way of living needs to be addressed, particularly around the idea of some kind of collective engagement for social support. So I'm working with the top of the poll in Norfolk, that's the Lord Lieutenant, the Queen's representative in the county, who runs all the social structures in Norfolk, and particularly she's interested in mental health. And she and I are meeting with this team that I've put together, and we're going to create an opportunity to help make the parishes look out for people who are endangered with mental health problems. Now, you may say that's some distance away from climate change, it's not. If we can raise 
and stop someone from struggling with mental health difficulties. And I mentioned to you in my talk, the figures are very high. 5,000 youngsters, it's a huge figure. It was 2,000 two years ago. Um, we're to, and we've had 49 suicides in British universities in the last six months. The young people, 18. You know, these are very serious matters. So I think what we're talking about is the beginning of a, of a changing pe some people's awareness. And that's why I mentioned leadership, Paolo. I think if we can come to people and show that by going together, things can be changed rather than one man talking to somebody else. So if I create this prize, it will be for leadership and community and evolution. It will not be about giving lectures to people. And mm -hmm. I think... What I'm saying is that the COVID experience is beginning to open up, and I said this to Anna in her, her question, it's opening up opportunities that we should be beginning to exploit as mm -hmm. functioning academics and transforming agents and saying, how can we make this work? And if I was you guys in ICS, you've got a unique group of people in there. How can we make our society cope with this particular disease in such a way that it becomes more resilient and, and learning from the sustainability message in the process. And that, I think, is a kind of challenge that you're asking, and I think that's the kind of challenge that we should do. But I thought I gave in my talk at least some hints. Caring society, spending more money in health and nurturing, maybe a basic income to people as part of a social deal, um, looking at pots of money so that people can set up local charities from um, carbon funds that make them, enable them to become more self-reliant when it comes to renewable energy. Those are the kinds of things which are now feasible in a post-COVID age, which I don't think people would have bothered about if we'd never had COVID at all, but still be flying all over, time, all over the world to Tenerife and to the Maldives and whatever, because that was just the way things were. So I, I do think there is an opportunity now. And it's, it's, it's worth getting it in the next six to nine months, which is why I'm very pleased about the timing of this lecture, because we don't know where we'll be in September 2021. And therefore, it's actually rather important to start saying things which are hopeful and engaging with people, especially if they're fraying at the edges, as we say in English, meaning they're losing heart, not being so confident about keeping on these high social structures in the next six and so months. So I think there's a lot to be said for engaging with communities as you're putting out and enabling them to see that it's worth their while doing these things slightly differently so they then can become more effective locally. And that's I want to stress that sustainable localism doesn't mean you have no global, it just means a different bias in the way in which we're putting our effort. And I thought Sonia, Sophia did an excellent job of showing how that bias could be delivered in the economic front. Okay, thank you. Um, Olivia and Sophia, do you want to comment something about the opportunities of COVID or something you want to comment or a short comment or do we? And very shortly, also just a comment with um, regarding Paulo. Uh, yes, definitely. I think uh, other areas of knowledge should engage with economists. Um, it's much. I think it would be much easier if um, if certain areas uh, of knowledge would learn more about economics and then engage with economists. I think that would be the, the best the best approach. Um, lessons learned from COVID. Uh, well, uh, things can change. Uh, but only if we feel that we are threatened. So we need to change this short-term perspective. Olivia, you want to say something or we... Yes, I can just... Uh, thanks, Luisa. And uh, just to follow on from both what uh, some of the comments that Sophia made on economics, uh, which I share deeply, um, it made me think also in terms of the solutions that Tim's points towards and Louisa, your comment on technology. If we think of the other famous crisis we had, the financial crisis, the so-called financial crisis of 2008, I mean, the lessons from that, the lessons of the responses we delivered and the ones, the many ones we did not deliver from that crisis would help a lot to avoid falling into the same traps. So uh, the Green New Deal, the... Um, whatever we're going to call it, the, the green growth, they may or may not deliver something wonderful in the line towards what Tim has pointed to. 
But chances are that having learned very little from the financial crisis, that some things will not fall into that uh, in, in that direction unless we we try to learn. You spoke about memory as well. But this is short term memory. It's only for eight years ago. But so much was missed as an opportunity. I mean, that was a very big crisis. And uh, we we paused and then we restarted. And the issue here is, can we reset the whole system? And to reset the system, we can't have certainly the economics that Sophia has uh, rather passionately and rightly uh, pointed to as, um, as an obstacle. I mean, it is an obstacle. It's um, a British economist who's a Keynesian uh, expert calls economics the tutor of governments. And it's it, as a way to deliver its centrality and in its importance in shifting decisions. So if that discipline has the shape and the colors that Sophia has illustrated and still has, we, we, need, to, we need to learn fast how to, how to change and how to integrate it back into other disciplines. I mean, yes, Sophia, we can learn economics, but as you I'm sure know, if, if, the, if that discipline does not want to learn, and it does, I mean, the problem is ecological economics has been around for 40 years, but that's not dominant mainstream economics. And, uh, and I hear everything that you say because it's been part of a lot of my research as well. And I've tried to um, also look at it from the interdisciplinary, and it is considered one of the most resist resilient and closed disciplines in the spectrum of open to interdisciplinarity. So, but that said, um, if we have people like you in economics, that's already a big, big plus, I think. And, <laughs> and we, need, uh, we need to have these, uh, these steps. So uh, in terms of technology, Luisa, I... I, I I know that you... <laughs> I, you know, of course, technology has a role. But the thing is, let me say it in the simplest of ways. Technology is a tool and it's not a mean. It's not an end. And the problem is when it becomes an end. And the same with economic growth. If it's a means to an end, it's fine. If it's an end, it's not so fine. All the crises that Tim has talked about, all the tipping points that we're faced with, are to a large extent in where things that should not be our goal become a goal. So deciding that our goal is well-being and deciding that our well-being depends and is completely integrated and not only in instrumental points, but also in spiritual and in, world, in, in cosmological senses. But we have to think of the well-being of the global south and of the other countries and well, of the people and all that. I totally agree. But is that through the, tra the technological transfer that big corporations can manage or what kind of technology? So it's not about whether technology is good or bad, but what, what, what is it supposed to serve? And then what is the best technological solution in, the, in different contexts? So, and also this global south, north south divide is, COVID has, has destroyed even more that divide making really the haves and the haves not uh, as the real divide across the globe in, in almost every possible direction without with that. Um, we have a new, a new geography of COVID. So um, uh, now we, we, we move to Viriato, Karen, to, we move to the Viriato intervention because we don't have more questions. Okay. So uh, Claudia, can you, we still have time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, wonderful. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. Present, but uh, until now, I didn't discover the capacity of ubiquity of being in two places at the same time. So this is a, a, a short presentation that I made, uh, commenting your uh, presentation, your your conference entitled "Assessing Moral Responses to COVID-19 
and to climate emergencies through sustainable localism. So my, my uh, comments are, are two, two comments, and they are organized um, uh, in the following way. Let me show. So the first one is, um, uh, is, a, is a, a comment on uh, the time frame, how did, how, uh, about the way you gave a name to the time frame we, we are in now. Uh, so the, it's a, about the name of the current historical period we are, are in. The second, um, it, it's about the, the space. So it's about the concept of localism and its relation with uh, globalism that is also somehow um, um, inherent to your um, um, analysis of uh, localism. So regarding the first one, where are we? Uh, you uh, named the, our current period as climate emergency. So you follow a big trend, a, a wide trend of, of uh, schoolers and uh, activists. Uh, and uh, of course, I agree that uh, there is a clim em climate emergency. However, I think that uh, I, I prefer to name the period we are in I prefer the more classical global environmental crisis concept, or sometimes in order to conciliate a little bit with uh, the, the current uh, stream of opinion, I also call this period global environmental climate crisis. So, so I, I, I do a kind of condensation between environment and climate uh, united by crisis. I have four main reasons to, um, it's, not, well, it's not clearly a, a dispute with you. I, I'm just trying to clarify the content of the title we are both giving to, the, to this period. So I have four reasons to prefer global environmental crisis to climate emergency. The first one is related with COVID-19. COVID-19 can't be considered the result of a tipping point induced by growing climate change, but it can be linked to the consistent last 30 to 40 years trend of zoonotic virus expansion. So we have at least more than that, but the most famous uh, phenomena of uh, zoonotic virus expansion were in China as well in 2002, 2003, the SARS. Uh, later on in 2012, another coronavirus uh, in Middle East, the MERS. And between these two dates, we have the, the flu, the new uh, virus of the flu uh, called the H1N1 in Mexico in 2009, 2010. <clears throat> uh, although climate emergency can be blamed by causing human and animal health problems, we have a, a good example in the uh, recent and very um, profound and very disturbing uh, book of David Wallace Wells um, about the inevitable earth. He, he tells us in that book, um, a study, a case study uh, of a saiga antelope species uh, that almost uh, was extinguished in 2015 in a certain region on account of the increase of average temperature. So there is, we know, I, I'm perfectly aware that uh, in the future we'll have a lot of uh, diseases connected with uh, climate change, with the warming. However, that's not the case in my opinion because of COVID-19. COVID seems more connected with the old fact of biodiversity depletion, habit intr intrusion, and with the set of moral values consolidated in the long past of modernity, departing from utopian and scientific thinking of the 16th century. So that's my first reason to disagree or to clarify the name of the time we are in. The, sec the second one, the second reason is because I consider that the concept of global environmental crisis opens to us a, a more complex window a more deep window of connections of, of elements 
And I am, I am using here a kind of a table of indicators that the first time I, I studied or I proposed that in a paper was in the beginning of 90s, it was in 91. Uh, the five uh, main dimensions of uh, environmental crisis, namely planetary dimension, irreversibility and entropy, that's the case, for instance, of bio biodiversity extinction, cumulative acceleration, uh, growing political, social, and cultural unrest, namely the decline of the classical state's power, and the risk of internal and or, or inter international conflict. So the, the, all the strategic uh, um, problems that are linked with, uh, with the environmental crisis, not just with climate change, but with environmental crisis. Uh, that's why I think that um, uh, I, would, I would rather prefer to the slide that, that you presented and I will show immediately after this one. Um, so the classical tipping point slide uh, presented by uh, Professor different uh, Stefan, uh, Schaunhuber and other, um, and other experts on climate change. Um, that's entirely correct. So the, the different tipping points that will be uh, increased and that will uh, reach a breaking point on account of the warming of the planet and other um, associated elements. However, I think that this, this scheme, this picture related with the um, project from Johan Rockström, Will Stefan and others called the Planetary Boundaries um, Project that you know very well, of course, um, gives you a, a more vivid systemic interaction of factors. So you have not just climate change, you have biodiversity, ocean acidification, stratospheric ozone depletion, um, and many others that are not strictly and directly connected with climate change. <clears throat> so this is the this is your slide. You have your name down, Timur Irden, <laughs> down. So. This is, I, I, I agree entirely with this. So if we are not able to stabilize in two degrees, we'll have more problems. Uh, if we are not able to stabilize in three degrees, we'll have even more problems and so on. However, I think that within the realm of your study, of your reflection about morality, about moral behavior, it's more important to go behind and before climate change, to, climb, to global environmental crisis. The reason number C, so that's it. Uh, um, environmental crisis comes before uh, climate change or climate emergency. Uh, if we separate climate change or climate emergency from global environmental crisis, we run into the risk of focusing the ontological and the existential threat we are facing now on the rather technocentric, and I am using your concept of technocentrism, narrative of energy transition. We have now a, a worldwide debate uh, between technocentrism and biodiversity and the soil conservation, for instance. We have that in Portugal. The government is very keen of uh, engaging Portugal in the lithium and other minerals, uh, rare minerals uh, exploitation in order to support the car industry, uh, the electric car industry um, investment. So we have here clearly a, 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 a collision route, a, a trade-off, a very difficult trade-off between ecosystem conservation and the struggle of car industry to survive on, on the basis of the electric mobility itself. It's clearly a, a conflict between localism and techno, technocentrism. And finally, the last uh, and probably the, the most complex reason, um, if, if you, uh, as I told you uh, in reason three, uh, if you concentrate yourself in climate change, you narrow the scope very much. And you open the, the, the door uh, to simplifications like that of uh, techno-centrism regarding the uh, uh, innovation of industry and so on. Uh, while if you concentrate yourself on the old and classic concept of global environmental crisis, you have the opportunity 
to have a deeper critical scrutiny of what I call the utopia scene, meaning that today we live in the dystopia resulting from the fulfillment of the modernist program of world conquest and domination of women, women, human, human, human um, uh, world conquest and dominion. So even under the moral perspective, I think it's 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 best it's best this this, this program or this uh, perspective because you can uh, you can address uh, at least three main dimensions. So the secularization process that is vital if you want to understand the way we are treating nature, the way we are um, destroying nature. You need to understand the spiritual process uh, by which we consider it and separate ourselves from nature. So it, 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 it is well before climate change, well, centuries before climate change. Third, uh, second dimension, the fairy tale of the unity of matter. So this is, I, I, I tell this, the fairy tale, not, not because I am <laughs> trying to substitute uh, uh, Newton and Einstein uh, through uh, Aristoteles, uh, but because this is a fairy tale. When you, you, you tell people that we are, uh, given the fact that all the, the, the stuff of the material stuff of the, the matter of the universe is made of 100 and something more chemical elements, uh, it means that the, you are in conditions to live everywhere in the universe. When Mr. Musk says that he's preparing the colonization of Mars, this is a fairy tale. And this is a very dangerous fairy tale because it hidden's from us the true. The true is that we are completely dependent from Earth. So we are devaluating the value of Earth with the magical promises of those technophile guys. And finally, the third reason why I think uh, global environmental crisis is, is, is best is because it helps us to understand the necrocene transformation of man and nature through global market society. So the necrocene, well, is a new concept. Uh, I'm not going to, to elaborate about this because I don't have time. Um, however, the process by which we build a market society is well known. And uh, uh, there is a big book of Karl Polanyi, The Great Transformation of 1944, or uh, the paper he wrote uh, about the same issue in 1947. Jumping, in, uh, jumping uh, using my the last two minutes um, uh, regarding the second comment. The second comment is about space, is about localism. And I am now working on your slide, this is very nice slide, two phases of sustainability, technocentrism and ecocentrism, uh, in which you place, and very well, very well placed, local self-reliance. So localism is in the field of ecocentrism. Uh, regarding this, my comment is the following. I think that we are not in conditions, uh, and probably that was not your vision. Anyway, regarding to the slides, it seems to be. Um, we can't oppose globally, uh, we can't oppose localism to the opposite concept that's obvious, globalism. Um, so even if we want to struggle for a self-resilience network of communities locally established, we need to take in into consideration that the still dominant, overwhelming dominant uh, dynamics, ruling dynamics of the world is global. If you look to the resilience and to the uh, investment programs uh, of all the European countries, regarding the COVID-19 uh, recovery, you will see that it's more of the same, basically more of the same. Airplanes, uh, roads, infrastructures, networks, trade networks, and so on, okay? So you, you can't look back, back that, backwards. You need to face that. So you need to find a way of um, blinding uh, 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 localism strategies with globalism strategies. Well, I put here a good example of um, the classical um, uh, sustainability uh, within the scope of uh, technocentrism. 
uh, those beautiful concepts uh, of the 90s and the beginning of the 20s, uh, 21st century, about uh, the factor four, about uh, uh, cap natural capitalism. Uh, so that's probably over because we are completely sure that the situation is, has become worse and worse. Um, and I think it's very important to uh, underline the need of connecting globalism with lo uh, localism, because if we look into the history of localism, we see, for instance, with Rob Hopkins um, uh, or uh, Sean Chamberlain, we see that those authors, and of course, uh, in a certain way, in a more mild way with Latouche or with uh, Tim Jackson, or in a more severe way with Jim Bendel in a very recent paper of 2018, we see that in a certain way, um, for many people, localism will, will be our destiny. However, will be our destiny after a collapse, a global collapse. So if we don't want to, um, uh, to embrace localism as the last resort solution, or, or, or la as, as the, the result of the shipwreck of our civilization, we need to combine, and I know it's very difficult to combine locally guided and directed strategies with the capacity of having a global picture, a world picture, a, a, roadmap, a roadmap for international relations. Finally, just the, the last one, it's, it's, it's amazing how things are running so quickly. Um, this is the famous Kuznet curve uh, that was um, uh, designed by Simon Kuznet in the 50s and the 60s about uh, inequality and, uh, and per capita income. Um, it, it showed that uh, uh, it was the Keynesian years, of course, the 30 glorious years, and uh, it showed that Inequality with industrialization in the first stage, there was, a, there was an increase of inequality, but after, afterwards, with the increase of, of prosperity of GDP, um, the inequality will slow down, uh, will dwindle, and the, the per capita in, income will, will, will grow. After 1991, we have the environmental Kuznet curve. That, that was a, 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 truly a fairy tale. So the idea that, okay, environmental damage appears in the start of industrialization, but when people is rich enough, society is rich enough to afford for public policies or environmental public policies, um, so the environmental will damage will decrease as well. This is this is fantasy. This is fantasy. So we don't have any 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 um, uh, good picture to show. Uh, except the need to think uh, with uh, intensity, with courage, and to act according to that. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want me to say anything? Vinyasa, are you uh, in any way visible or are you invisible? It was just purely a video. I mean, he was, video. so he can't answer. Yes, he can't answer. <laughs> you can say everything you want. <laughs> um, first of all, it was a wonderful, very classically video, video to style of presentation. You have to bear in mind, I have a friend who says to me, I'm writing a PhD on, on Shelley. Don't ask me to write a PhD on Keats instead. I didn't start by saying that I was trying to deal with the global environmental crisis in this talk. I was talking about what can we learn morally from a response to COVID-19 in relation to a response to the carbon burden. That was a deliberate choice to look at that relationship and explore it from an ICS point of view. So from my point of view, I have any problems at all about Viriato saying that COVID-19 is a product of zoonotic transfer and is in that sense a biodiversity problem except that it is a sustainability breakdown that's created COVID-19, not a biodiversity problem. And so the themes that I gave you on sustainability are central to why the Chinese wet markets exist, their capitalistic enterprises 
with brutal use of wild animals. And so you cannot begin to say that COVID-19 is a biodiversity issue. It's a straight out and out piece of exasperated economics that Sophia was talking about in her presentation earlier. But we could spend hours on that. I'm not going to, except to say that there are at least five pandemics waiting in the wings. And one of the things that we tend to think about COVID-19 is it somehow will go away. There's hardly a politician not saying something on the airwaves every day, it will eventually go away. First of all, I'd have no doubt whatsoever that COVID-19 be with us forever. It would become an endemic virus. And secondly, there are viruses waiting out there amongst all kinds of wild animals that almost certainly will be unleashed upon us in the next two to five years if we carry on doing what we're doing. So I'm afraid um, Viriaj and I both agree and disagree. We disagree because that wasn't the focus of my talk, but I don't worry about that because you have to have some kind of focus in any talk. But I also want him to understand it's a failure of sustainability, which was a central part of my talk that gave rise to COVID-19 and actually will keep it there ticking over even if we try to suppress it. So that's my first point. The second point when he was talking about the nature of the changing way in which we're looking at the climate crisis, I think we and I entirely agree with that. that the climate crisis is global, it is diversifying and, uh, and breaking people down. It is extremely divisive for people and is giving rise to haves and have nots on a grand scale. So all the things that Lou, um, Vili actually talked about on climate in terms of the so-called existential element, I think we're basically on the same wavelength. And he showed the patterns of the breakdown of the so-called social global barriers, you know, the, the uh, system um, safeguards it's in that famous diagram of red bands. Where, where I think we have more of a disagreement, and I don't think it's a big issue. Vinayat was a good friend and I respect his opinion. <laughs> is first of all, all that literature on what is called um, industrial eco-management, you know, vice, one vice hacker and all that crap, that stuff is quintessentially technocentric. It's quintessentially yes. failed. Nobody, no business has become more efficient in the point of view of its use of resources and its use of um, materials. They may have reduced some of the wastage, but they haven't got anywhere near the so-called circular economy that Vice von Weissacker and that list that um, he gave. And the reason for that is the economic, let's see, Sophia's point, has created a series of incentives which, or put it a better way, of disincentives which make it impossible for businesses to do this kind of thing and survive in a capitalistic world in, in global markets. So you know, we have to bear in mind that these ideas of these German and other uh, technical specialists, Robert Ayers, I know all these people well, they were all part of my background in the 80s. They've had no influence whatsoever on the way technology is operated in business. The bit that I did have some very disturbing relations with in his presentation was the idea that localism is a kind of failed outcome, that you collapse, the system collapses and out of the rubble comes localism. I find that very defeatist. And the whole point of my presentation was not to give that impression that localism is something we can actually fight for and make work while. And if you look at the, as uh, um, Olivia said, the, the, one of the two things associated with the great crash was that it, it recreated globalism on a big scale and it massively increased in disparity and inequality. And in fact, one of the reasons why COVID is so brutal in the modern age is because that inequality was built into the system from 19, 2008 on. And the people at the far end of the scale, the ones who are dying from COVID in great numbers. Um, so I think what we have to bear in mind is that localism, should, it cannot be seen, in my view, as some residual from a failed capitalistic system. It's going to be seen as something that you strive for in what I would call, and what Olivia talked about, called blending knowledge. The, the thing that I would love ICS to do, think something about, is how can you blend knowledge so that we can actually create a new form of understanding, like mixing bits of knowledge. And Sophia touched on this, and it's in there, which is moral and economic and political and social blended. And localism gives you that opportunity. So for me, the, one of the powers of localism is actually creates a new form of learning, a new form of engagement, and a new form communication 
and, and that's why and, and, and in the right hands that leads to sustainability that's my point i've made that point i'm not going to repeat it many times in this evening but if i was in the ics i would be urging more opportunity and i think the, the phd class is fabulous for this more opportunity for encouraging students to blend knowledge to realize that localism is a power for good if it's handled right to use leadership as part of that transformation and to find that from that mutual learning, we can come out of this rather pickle called the COVID and the carbon age with at least some opportunity of getting us into a better, more hopeful world. I didn't, frankly, see that in the last end of Viriatu's talk as being a very hopeful scenario. I happen to believe firmly that if you put your shoulders to the wheel, we put it in English, between now and 2030, we can make things really happen. And we have a golden opportunity because COVID, in its own strange way, has created conditions that actually force us to reassess what we mean by sustainability and what we mean by a carbon heavy age. And, and that includes anything to do with biodiversity and planetary crisis. All of these things from that concern are all part of the package. But for me, I don't need to worry whether you're talking about carbon or COVID, you're talking about transforming people into ways which can be in knowledge and action terms, much more exciting and much more fruitful than we had before. And I'll leave you because for me, optimism is about having a drive and energy, a belief. If you don't have that kind of drive and energy belief, you don't have momentum. If you don't have momentum, you can't move. You just sit stable. And then the clouds of what we call miasma gather around your head and leaves you still and stable and stultified. That's not the human condition. Thank you, Tim. I think we're coming to the end. Karin, I think we have to, I don't know if someone wants to intervene. Um, I will tell Virya to your comments and your reaction. John, I love him dearly, by the way. There's nothing <laughs> exactly. exactly. I'm upset about. Okay. Uh, so we're coming to, I think it was very interesting, all this, and very, very inspiring, all this discussion. Uh, if Sophia and Oliver don't want to say, I don't know if you want to intervene. No. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim, for um, your talk and uh, your all, everything you, you give to us this afternoon. And thank you, Olivia, thank you, Sofia, thank you, Viriato, and thank you, all of you that were participating. We, have, we had more than 100, 100 participants, um, and uh, they were listening and, and asking things, and uh, so it was, it was very, very good. So uh, this was a, a very inspiring day our academic open day and um, thank you all of you and uh, see you see you i hope personally <laughs> i'd like to have just one final comment about yes, ICS. Mm -hmm. the, the zoom is a strange beast it has many advantages and many disadvantages but the biggest disadvantage is that we never get to hug each other on the zoom so you don't get that sense of comradeship but there's four pages. At one point, there were four pages. And if you look at the four pages, they're filled with students whose names I recognize. And I know one of the things that I really feel very proud of, Louisa, and all of you in ICS, is my contribution to that course over the years, now 13 years. And the fact that students have gone out of that course and done some wonderful things because they're smart and they were already well positioned. And I do honestly believe that sometimes someone along the line might say, what's the role of ICS? You know, there's a world out there sometimes asks whether universities are still as relevant in the nature of the modern age. And I think one of them, one, what you must always say to yourself is, how can we actually make ourselves even more indispensable because you're powerful enough? And my final plea is that we're working in the British Academy, what, and this has been asked of by our government chief scientific advisor, Patrick Valance, he said to the British Academy, please give us some vision of what society could look like after COVID-19. And I think what other place in Portugal 
could start that debate, but who are in front of me in this screen right now. What might society look like in 2030 in the wake of COVID-19 that could actually be worth pursuing and give ICS an active role in the capability of creating a village of that vision of that kind? To do nothing is actually to step backwards, not even to stay in the same place. It's a very good challenge to all of us. Uh, so we won't have the Dean now because he's very occupied with this pandemic situation. Uh, so thank you, Tim, again. Thank you, all of you. And um, Karen, you want to say something or? OK. Um, so it's almost 6 o'clock. It was a very, very, very inspiring afternoon. Bye bye, adeus a todos e muito obrigado uh, pela presença, pela participação e, pela, um, e, e, e por estarem aqui connosco hoje neste dia da abertura do ano académico. Adeus. Luísa, you're wonderful. Thank you so much for everything. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Adeus a todos e obrigado. Adeus.